Mr Costello. The next witness is Mr Tapsell. Yes. Please, Ms Williams, witness. Tapsell. Council of your organisation is operating as the witness securer, Ms. Williams. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I understand Mr. Tapsell's just outside the court, so he just be a moment. I apologise, Commissioner. Tapsall, if you'd be good enough to come forward. Just Mr Tapsall, can I ask first whether you'd uh, wish to make an oath or take an affirmation? An affirmation, please. you mind standing then whilst the affirmation is administered? Yes. I solemnly and sincerely... I solemnly and sincerely... Declare and affirm... Declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth will be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth. Yes, do sit down, Mr. Tapsell. Yes, Ms. Williams. Commissioner, might my, my instructing solicitor approach the witness box just to hand to Mr. Tapsell some yes. documents he will need? Thank you. <coughs> Uh, is your full name Tony Colin Tapsell? Yes. Uh, and your business address is 111 Eagle Street, Brisbane, is that right? Yes. And you're the general manager, retail branch network for Northern Queensland and Northern Territory for Australia and New Zealand Banking Group? Yes. Uh, Mr Tapsell, have you made a statement dated the 21st of June 2018 uh, in response to questions asked by the Commission in rubric 413? Yes, I have. Uh, and you have that statement with you? Yes, I do. Uh, and are the contents of that statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Uh, Mr Tapsell, have you also made a statement dated the 25th of June 2018 in response to questions asked by the Royal Commission for rubric 441? Yes. Uh, you have that statement with you also? Yes, I do. And are the contents of that statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. And Mr Tapsell, have you made a supplementary statement dated the 4th of July 2018 in relation to both of those rubrics? Yes, I have. Uh, and uh, are the contents of that statement also true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Uh, Mr Tapsell, have you received a summons dated the 21st of June 2018 to appear before this Royal Commission to give evidence and to produce your rubric 413 statement? Yes, I have. Uh, you have that summons with you there, Mr Tapsell? Yes. Commissioner, I tender the summons. Uh, summons uh, to Mr Tapsell, Exhibit 4.201. Uh, and Commissioner, Mr Tapsell's statement dated the 21st of June 2018 in response to that summons is produced and I tender it. Exhibit 4.202 is the statement dated 21 June 18. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Tapsell, have you also received a summons dated the 2nd of July 2018 to appear before the Commission to give evidence and produce your rubric 441 statement? Yes, I have. And you have that summons with you there? I see. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I tender that summons. Exhibit 4.203 will be the further summons of 2 July 18. And Mr Tapsell's statement dated the 25th of June 2018 is produced in response to that summons and I tender it. Exhibit 4.204 will be that statement. And uh, Commissioner, my instructing solicitors have been informed that the Commission regards those two summonses as also requiring the production of Mr Tapsell's supplementary statement. And uh, that supplementary statement dated the 4th of July 2018 is produced in response to the summonses and I tender that statement. Exhibit 4.205 will be the supplementary <laughs> statement of 4 July 18. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Costello. Thank you, Commissioner. 
<coughs> Mr. Tapsell, you're the general manager of ANZ's Northern Queensland and Northern Territory Branch Network. Yes. Um, Australia-wide, ANZ has 19 branches in remote communities. Yes, 19 branches and two agencies. Two agencies. Could you um, explain the difference between a branch and an agency? There's no defined definition within the ANZ that I've been able to find. Um, is there a practical difference? An, ag an agency runs under the branch BSB, we call it, which is the locator uh, of, a, of another branch. So in the case of Groot Island, it runs under the Darwin branch number. And in the case of Yalara, it operates under the Alice Springs branch number. And save for um, sharing a BSB with a branch proper, is there any other difference between an agency and a branch? They may operate under slightly reduced hours, but essentially products and services are the same. So anything that you can do in a branch, you can do in an agency? Yes. Thank you. Um, of the 19 uh, bran branches ANZ has in remote communities, I think that perhaps five of them are in the geographic region that you've got responsibility for? Yes. Is that right? Yes. Um, and in addition to branch and agency presence, ANZ operates 54 ATMs in remote communities in Australia? Yes. And those ATMs are in addition to any fee-free ATMs that are part of a scheme that ANZ is a participant in? Yes, that's correct. Right. You say in your statement that ANZ has 136,548 retail customers living in remote communities? Yes. Does that sound a familiar that figure? That sound, sounds right. Sorry. And those customers held around 374,000 bank accounts? Yes. Your role at ANZ, Mr Tapsell, is very much uh, connected with the, op the practical operation of branches, is that right? Yes. You have ultimate supervision for all of the branches and agencies in your area? And um, your area is Northern Queensland and Northern Territory. Um, where in Queensland does your uh, geographic location stop? Uh, the easiest way to, I can explain it is uh, if you take the Gold Coast, Brisbane and the Sunshine Coast out of Queensland, geographically the rest of Queensland's mine. So The rest of Queensland is called Northern Queensland for the purpose of your role? Yes. But includes everything down to the border of New South Wales? Yes, that's Save for the Gold Coast. That's correct. Um, I'd like to ask you some questions about the role of branches in modern banking in Australia. Are you aware of how many branches ANZ has nationally at the moment? Uh, approximately 640. And are branches considered profit centres? Not to my knowledge. I, n I don't know. Is the financial performance of individual branches something that is measured? Maybe. It's not something I see. It's not something that you're responsible for within your area? I, I don't see the financial figures uh, specific. I see the cost figures. Yes. Not the, financial, not the revenue side of the, the business. What metrics do you see that are measured? We see uh, the branch performance in relation to uh, customer feedback, uh, m individual components within that branch around uh, the number of uh, reviews we do with our customers, uh, the number of uh, products that are put in place for customers. Uh, as I mentioned, we also have uh, customer feedback that we talk about at both an individual and a, and a branch level for both the review and uh, home loans. Is the volume of deposits measured? Yes. Uh, what about the volume of loans written? Yes. The number of accounts opened? Yes. Uh, what about the average balance of accounts in a branch? No. The income earned from accounts held at a branch? No. Say in your statement that since January 2011, ANZ has closed 10 branches in remote communities? Yes. 
Do you know why those branches were closed? I could speak specifically to my branches that were in that area. Thank you. And that, that on the basis of uh, less foot, foot traffic to the branch, uh, that was one of the main points. People are choosing other ways to do their banking and there's other opportunities and digital channels and uh, so pe far less uh, people are actually frequenting upon our branch, my branches in that particular case. Is uh, ANZ, to your knowledge, planning further branch closures at the moment? Yes. And does that include in your area? Uh, not at the moment, no. Thank you. Um, can I take you to a document, please? It is ANZ.700.008. Dot double zero six zero. Uh, Mr. Tapsell, this is a document entitled uh, Branch Options Final Recommendations. Yes. You've seen this document before? Yes, I saw it yesterday. Yes. You hadn't seen this document before you prepare, pre started preparing your evidence? No. Thank you. Um, the two authors on the front are um, Ms Noble and Mr Freeman. Do, do you report to Ms Noble? No, my boss reports to Ms Noble. All right, so who do you report to? Uh, Paul Presley. And what's his title? <coughs> uh, General Manager Retail Distribution Network. So he's the General Manager Retail Distribution Network. And Ms Noble is the Managing Director Retail Distribution? Yes. That's the way the chain of command works? Yes. Thank you. Is it Ms Noble that has ultimate responsibility for ANZ's Australian branch network? Ms Noble reports into the CEO of Australia Division. Yes. Mr Fred Olson. Thank you. And Mr Olson is, I think, a member of the group executive? Yes. <coughs> uh, this document is headed Final Recommendations. Do you know who they were recommendations to? No. If we go over to the page to 0061, see the executive summary. And it says at the top of the document, to ensure alignment between ANZ's purpose and our branch optimisation objectives, we have recently explored the viability of selling a package of regional, rural and remote branches as an alternative to closures. This sought to improve continuity of banking services for customers, <coughs> provide ongoing employment options for local workers, minimise broader impacts on regional and remote communities, recognising the commercial and social role of bank branches. See that? Yes. And, and then there's another heading, the outcome of this work, the outcomes of this work are as follows, and it speaks of a possible sale of some branches. And on, in the third bullet point down, it says the transaction appears to be feasible from a technical, legal and possible from a regulatory perspective. Yes, I can see that. There's then discussion of um, adverse financial outcomes for ANZ shareholders of a potential sale. And it notes in the first bullet point under that that in regional, rural and remote areas, ANZ historically experiences remarkably low customer attrition when closing a branch. See that? Yes. Does that accord with your experience of branch closures in your area? I don't see customer attrition figures. I see. Um, it then points to some further risks and then it says at the very bottom of the page, which I hope you can see on your screen there, based on these facts we recommend to continue with the current plan for branch closures. And that is um, a recommendation not to proceed with the possible sale of some branches that have been discussed, but rather to proceed with the closure of those branches. Is that how you understand 
the recommendation to work. I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat that? Can you see at the bottom of the page? Yes. And, and by all means, if you need a bit more time to read, if you want to read the whole of the page, feel free to take the time. Would you like to do that? Yes, if I could. Yes, thank you. Tell me when you're ready. Sorry, can I? Can, whoever blew it up, can you blow it up again for me a little bit, please? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Costello. Thank you. So you see the recommendation at the foot of the page is based on these facts we recommend to continue with the current plans for branch closure. Yes, that's what I can see there. That is a recommendation to, to proceed with the closure of branches as opposed to an alternative proposal which was to sell a package of branches. This document's not mine and I've seen it for the first time yesterday, so uh, I don't know the package of branches as opposed to uh, other options that may have been explored at the time either. Yes, um, but can you see in the second heading the outcomes of this work are as follows? And it says a possible sale package of, and then there's a number that's been yes. redacted, Reg regional, rural and remote branches was identified <coughs> based on future opportunity. Yes, I can see that. See that? So one of the things being considered here is the sale of some branches, which I've called a package of branches, but just say a sale of some branches. Um, and the recommendation is not to go down that path, instead to continue with the current plans for closure. You see that? That's what it looks like in this document, yes. yes. All right, thank you. And then if we go over the page to 0062, says a possible sale package of re regional, remote and rural branches was considered. ANZ is the last ma major bank in town in, and then it's redacted, but in some of the locations ANZ is the last major bank in town. See that? Yes, I can see that. Yes. And you've seen a version of this document presumably that yes, didn't I saw have this. the redactions I for saw confidentiality. This. Yes, I saw this yesterday. Yes, yes. Um, so what's being considered particularly relates to regional, remote and rural branches? In, in this slide, yes. Slide. And in the previous slide, from the line that I took you to, there was the same phrase, regional, remote and rural. Yes. Do you recall that? Yes. Yes. Could we then please move to 0070? You can see here there is consideration of a range of factors that would um, touch on the decision. To this point in time, the consideration in the document has been uh, principally as to the competing financial considerations of um, closure versus sale. But at this slide, there are a large range of factors taken into account. Can you see that? Yes. And the final factor taken into account is rural community impact. Yes, I can see that. 
and it notes that transferring responsibility for certain regional communities to a third party is preferable to closure slash exiting. Yes, I can see that. Potentially mitigates rural job losses, economic decline in some locations. Yes. Both options enable more focused support to a smaller set of communities. Yes. And from your experience in <coughs> running a part of ANZ's branch network that includes branches in rural and remote locations, would you agree that a branch presence can be an important uh, can be important for a town. In my experience, it can be important for a town. Thank you. I, I would also add, oh, sorry, I don't know the context of this document. Yes, but you're t you are taking me obviously to certain places within the document, but the the rest of it, as I said, I've only seen it for the first time yesterday. So the, the context of the branches, uh, I. Sorry, I don't have that level of information. I understand that. Um, I'll take you to one more page in this document, I think, uh, 0071, which is the next page. You see here the proposed next steps. Um, the first one is continue with the current program of 50 branch closures during FY17. Now, do you recall whether that is about the number of branches that ANZ did close in that financial year? Sorry, I, I don't recall. I Do you recall know. if there were branches closed in your area in that financial year? Yes, th there would have been. Do you remember how many? Uh, can I just refer to my statement? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, in my area, there was one in FY17. Thank you. And when there is a branch closure in your area, is that something that you have to become involved with in your role, or is that taken out of your hands and handed to somebody else? We become involved, yes. Um, and at what point do you become involved in the closure of a branch in your area? Has the decision been made to close it when you're notified? No. A decision has not been made to close it? No, we're, in, we're involved in the operational component of it. Is your view sought on whether or not it ought to be closed or if there's any consideration that is relevant to it being closed? In my role, we yes. are asked around the considerations of closing a specific site, yes. Yes. And when you're asked that, would you have a discussion with the local manager as well? We would discuss it with the district manager, yes. District manager. And is the way that ANZ's branch network operates that there are managers in each branch and they report to a district manager? Yes. And then that man district manager reports to you in your region? Yes. And how many districts are there in your region? Six. Thank you. Um, how many of those districts are in the Northern Territory? One. The Northern Territory is a district? The Northern Territory is a district. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner, I tender that document. Branch options, final recommendation, ANZ 700 0060, exhibit 4.2 06. Um, Mr. Tapsell, that document was um, dated on the front, you might recall, March 2017. I now want to take you to another document. It's ANZ.700.008, <coughs> This is a document prepared, well, it's dated the 26th of April, so it's a month or um, seven or eight weeks, perhaps, after the document I've just taken you to, and it's prepared by Ms Noble. And as you can see there, it says for CEO discussion on 26... Sorry, it says it's for CEO discussion on 26 April 2017. <coughs> can you see that? Yes. And it says for decision. 
Yes. Do you understand from that page that this is something Ms Noble has prepared to discuss with the CEO so that he can make a decision? That's how I would understand the document, yes. If we could go to um, the next page, 0003. See here, for decision, action requested. Approval is sought to accelerate closures resulting in an Australian branch network of blank branches by 30 September 2019. Yes, I can see that. Closure would accelerate from 50 in 2017 <coughs> to blank in each of 2018 and 2019. Reduction from 677 branches is estimated to cost, and then there's some figures quoted. Um, it says there are a reduction <coughs> from 677 branches. Do you recall how many branches ANZ has now? Yes, uh, my understanding, about 640. I don't have an exact number today. So since the date of this document, there have been further closures from 670 to around 640, you think? It, judging by this document, yes. And then you can see in the second last bullet point, this proposal extends earlier analysis, which indicated relatively low value from potential sale options. Yes, I can see that. Recall that in the last document I took you to, there was an analysis of potential sale and the recommendation was to continue with closure rather than sale? Yes. And then it says in the final bullet point, closure of less productive branches is consistent with ANZ's purpose in mm -hmm. enabling concentration of resources into significantly better physical and digital interactions enabling more customers to thrive. What do you understand that to mean? Sorry, the, without the context or being directly involved in this, I, I can't provide an answer to that. All right. Um, can I take you to the next page, 0004? You see the heading there, around 70% of the <coughs> proposed blank number of branches of branch closures are lower contributors in regional and remote locations, as well as some metro sites where the speed of digital adoption by customers will likely be high. Yes, see I can see that. The, the second part of that uh, sentence. Um, as well as some metro sites where the speed of digital adoption by customers will likely be high. Is it your experience that you're one of the reasons there are there may be fewer people attending branches in metropolitan areas is because they're banking in a different way? Online or telephone, for example? That would be my experience. But again, I don't know what else is within this document. No, 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 I, I understand that. But I just want to speak to you in your capacity at the moment. I think you gave some evidence very early on that um, one of the things that is happening to branches is that people are banking in different ways. Yes. That's and in your own experience, do you think that that is more prevalent in metropolitan areas than it might be in rural and remote areas? But that's something I can't answer, sorry. I don't see any data on that. Okay. Um, could I take you to triple zero six, please? <coughs> Do you, in the course of your um, role with ANZ, consider the relative performance of ANZ branches as opposed to your competitors? Uh, not at branch level. I don't see reporting on that. No. Um, is ANZ's market position in terms of branches and what it offers to customers who come into branches something that is uh, important to ANZ? Sorry, I missed the start of your question. Then. Right. Uh, is the offering, is, is the service that ANZ offers to customers who come into its branches something that's important to ANZ? Yes. And 
do you know from your own role that ANZ considers what its competitors are doing and seeks to do something that differentiates itself? S strategically, I, I wouldn't be able to say. One thing we'll speak about later is the A to Z review. Is that something that you would say differentiates ANZ? I think that is something we do try to differentiate ourselves on. And saying that I'm not fully aware of what the other organisations do. Right. I'll just take you to one more document, uh, one more page in this document, which is 0013. You see there, ANZ now has the smallest branch network among the majors. Although Westpac has fewer core Westpac branded branches than ANZ in all states. Are you looking at 2005? Sorry, I was, at, well, um, I was doing the typical lawyer thing and avoiding right. looking at the numbers and reading instead the words and the column next to it. <laughs> the, the first bullet point, which is says ANZ now has the smallest branch network among the majors. Oh, my apologies, yes, I see that. That's all right. You're doing the banker thing and looking at the numbers, <laughs> which is understandable. <coughs> Did you understand before you read that paragraph that ANZ had the smallest branch network? Uh, I knew we were close to the smallest, yes, but I wasn't 100% sure that that was the case. And did you know that there was um, consideration of further reducing the size of that network? From 2016. From the documents you've shown me, yes, I understand that. Okay. And then it says in the second bullet point only Westpac is closing branches at a higher rate? Yes. And there's some comments about what NAB and CBA are doing. Now, I asked you at this early on whether or not the individual profitability of branches was measured, and I think you said you weren't sure. Uh, sorry, I said that's not something I see. Yes. Are, are you aware of whether it's measured? No, I'm not aware. All right. But the volume of <coughs> deposits is measured? That's one of the measurements that we have. And yes. the number of accounts opened? Yes. And the number of loans written by a branch? Yes, that's part of the staff performance yes, measurement. Yes, thank you. Um, Commissioner, I tender that document. Accelerated branch closures <coughs> presentation for 26 April 17 ANZ 700 008 treble 02 exhibit 4.207. Mr Tatzel, what did you do before you assumed your current role? I was a district manager in Brisbane. And what district was that? Brisbane West. How many branches are in the Br Brisbane West district? Sorry, Mr. Costello. Now or? Oh, at the time. At the time, uh, eleven. Eleven. Are there less now? Yes, there are less. Now. How many now? Sorry, I couldn't tell you that off the top of my head. Right, because that's one of the districts that you're not responsible for because it's in the metropolitan zone of the southeast corner of Queensland. Is that right? Yes. That's yes. Right. Thank you. Um, since you've come into your new role, you have um, no doubt travelled to branches in rural and remote locations? Yes. Right. And do you appreciate that um, closing a branch in a rural or remote location can be a very large step for a bank? Yes. And can be a very dislocating uh, experience for a community, potentially? Yes. And do you think that it's um, appropriate um, for a bank like ANZ to maintain a branch presence in a location where there is no other bank? That's something I can't answer. And have you spoken with any of your superiors at ANZ about this document or the earlier one that I took you to? 
No, I haven't. All right. So you don't know if Mr Elliott accepted the recommendations that were in this document? No, I don't. All right. Thank you. Um, Mr Tapps, I want to, that document can come down. Thank you. Um, I want to move to a different topic now, which um, is the evidence that was given by Ms Doe earlier today. <coughs> Were you in court when Ms Doe gave that evidence? No. Right. Did you see that evidence? Uh, a small portion of it. All right. You chose not to listen to Ms Doe's evidence? Sorry, I was trying to get across my own statement a little bit further. I, I, I'm not <laughs> criticising. <laughs> Yet. Um, you've read the statement that Ms Doe made to the Commission? Yes, I've looked at it, yes. Not her, oral, not her oral evidence, I mean the written, the written document, you've read that? Yes, I've gone through it, yes. Yes. And you've made investigations uh, with ANZ staff in connection with the matters set out in that statement, is that right? Yes. Spoken to a number of ANZ employees? Yes. And I think that, um, in fairness to you, you set out at the end of your statement the names of the people you've spoken to in connection with different aspects of that evidence. Do you recall doing that? Yes, for that statement I've spoken to a number of people. Yes. Including people directly involved? Yes. Including the banker directly involved? Yes. Yes. And was that a person that you knew before you came to speak to them in connection with Ms Doe's evidence? Yes. That banker is somebody that you, you know? Yes. 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 Through, through working. <coughs> yes. Because it's a branch that you're responsible for? Yes. Thank you. Um, can I just, before we turn to the detail of that evidence, can I just understand the way uh, branches are now organised? A, like uh, a branch like Catherine has somebody who is called the mm. branch manager, is that right? Yes. And then below the branch manager there are people of different levels of seniority with different titles to reflect their seniority? Yes. And would it be fair to say that the person involved um, in uh, dealing with Ms Doe was a senior person within the branch? Yes, they were a senior person within the branch. You can recall who the person is. I know who the person yes, is, yes. Yes, but we're not using that person's name, but you know who that person is, and that's a, that person is a senior person within the branch, but he's not the branch manager. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, now, you're aware, I take it, that Ms Doe's evidence was that her clients come from a remote Indigenous community that's about an hour and a half drive from Catherine? Yes. Um, and that during the wet season, the road into and out of the community is sometimes closed? I understand that to be in Ms Doe's statement, yes. And um, that for the two particular clients that she mentions in her statement, travelling into Catherine is difficult because, apart from being a long trip, they have young children? I understand that to be the case, yes. All right. And Ms Doe's evidence was that in mid-December 2017, her colleague Penny attended the Catherine branch of ANZ and inquired about an access basic account. And she was told, that is Penny was told, that that type of account is no longer available to new customers. Sorry, can you take me to the document on this? To the statement of yes. Ms Doe? Yes, yes I can. <coughs> It's WI, I think so. It's um, WIT triple zero one double zero seven five triple zero one. And if we could move to paragraph eleven, which is at triple zero three. Can you see there in paragraph eleven, Ms Doe had said that. In mid-December 27, prior to going on leave, Penny went 
to the ANZ Catherine branch to ask whether the Access Basic account was available to new customers, Penny was advised by an ANZ banker that the Access Basic account was no longer available to new customers. The banker recommended the Pensioner Advantage account as an alternative for customers that were, were receiving a government pension. Do you recall it, reading that? Yes, I can see that in Ms Doe's statement. And have you made inquiries as to the truth of that statement? I've made inquiries on the basis of Ms Doe's statement, yes. Yes, you've discussed that paragraph in that statement with people within ANZ Bank? Yes. Including the banker involved? Yes. And what did those inquiries reveal? Can I go to my statement? Please? You can. Um, I'm not sure that you deal with this in your statement, but I... Commissioner, I I'm sorry to interrupt. While Mr Tapps is going through that part of his statement, may I apply for a non-publication order in relation to Mr Tapsell's evidence at uh, 4037.41 of the transcript to 4038.2? Uh, the application is made on the same basis um, uh, that the application was made and, as I understand it, granted in relation to uh, the banker's particular title. Where it's referred to uh, in Ms Doe's statement. There is a concern about St staff being ind indirectly identified and consequences for those staff. I understand staff. that, but uh, does the bare description as a senior person? Uh, I'm just, I'm, I, I understand. No, I'm just expressing uh, a little surprise, but uh, that's no doubt you will tell me surprise born of ignorance. Uh, I, I understand that. that common is enough. <laughs> I understand that is a concern given the, the size of the branch staff, Commissioner. Could I suggest, Commissioner, something that might assist you is if a, an unredacted version of paragraph 11 was handed to you, the point being made might be slightly clearer to you. Thank you. Back um, to my name, I might have one. Well, do you say I should make this NPD or not? I, I, I tried to be careful in my questioning, but I appreciate the concern. I wouldn't oppose it. Yeah, I, look, I'll make the, order, the direction you seek. Um, I'm always very hesitant about non-publication directions, if only because people go to jail if they disobey them and I don't want uh, uh, to make orders that uh, uh, I shouldn't make. Uh, and if you press it, I will make it, Ms Williams, but do you think uh, 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 is your journey really necessary was the question that was asked at one time. Uh, the evidence I... Uh... <coughs> Pardon me one moment, Commissioner. Uh, just to clarify, I don't seek the order in relation to uh, questions about journey being necessary, but... Ah, I'm sure <laughs> don't follow the red herring, Ms. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, is the NPD really necessary? I, I'm instructed that, that it is in the circumstance of this particular branch, Commissioner. Yes, well, Mr Costello, what do you say? Commissioner, I'm not going to oppose it. Well, there'll be a non-publication direction in uh, respect of the evidence given by this witness at uh, transcript page 4037 from line... 41, Commissioner. 41 through to 4038 uh, at line uh, 2. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Mr Tapsell, I was asking you about inquiries that you made in connection with this paragraph in the evidence. Um, now, do you recall the discussions that you had in connection with this paragraph? 
Yes, and while I wasn't obviously present during any of these meetings between these two individuals, uh, I am taking both versions of events uh, under in my statement, and that's been mentioned in my statement. Uh, but I do understand that this is Ms Doe's version of, of what occurred on that, that yes. day. But my question is, do you recall discussing Ms Doe's version, in particular this paragraph, with the relevant person at ANZ? With the banker, yes. Yes. Do you have a recollection of that? Yes. Right. And what did the banker say to you in response to this paragraph? She said that wasn't the case. That wasn't her understanding of this discussion. Right. And what was her understanding? That this was never discussed at, that, at this particular point. <coughs> was not discussed? The banker has said that she. The banker said that this wasn't discussed at this point a time, and had never said that it was no longer available to new customers. Okay, I just want to make sure I understand that. Does the banker say that there wasn't a discussion at this time, or does the banker say there was a discussion, but it was different to this? It was different to this. All right, thank you. If this was, the, just assume for present purposes that a discussion took place along these lines, you accept that that information is incorrect? That Access Basic accounts are available to new customers? Access Basic accounts are available to new customers, yes. Thank you. Have you made any inquiries about the number of Access Basic accounts that were established in the Catherine branch in 2017? No specific inquiries along that line, no. Okay. Is there any reason you didn't? No. Were you concerned when you read this paragraph that perhaps it could be the case that customers had been given incorrect advice? Again, this is one version of the events. Yes. And when you read this version of the events, we are all concerned if in that incorrect advice may have been given? It's not something I've tried to reconcile between the two different versions. You've not sought to reconcile the two versions? No, as I've said, I've the, the two versions have been outlined in my statement. Yes. But you, you dispute various aspects of Ms Doe's evidence, don't you? We give the banker's view as well. Yes. And where there is an inconsistency between the banker's statements to you and Ms Doe's evidence, you say the banker's version is the version that should be accepted? No, Mr Costello. We've got both versions and where there's a discrepancy, sorry, within the document, we highlight that and both, both versions are put. I see. So you don't say that the banker's version is necessarily correct? You're just, uh, I, you're just relaying what the banker told you, is that the position? Based on my inquiries with the banker, is what is within my statement. Um, I'm just going to ask you that question again because I'm not quite sure that I understand your answer. Where in your witness statement you outline a version of events that is different to the version that Ms Doe gives in her statement, do you say the Commissioner should accept that the banker is right? I'm not making a call on that within my statement. Right. So you're simply just putting forward the evidence of as told to you by the banker, but no more? Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, I think that it's common ground that the first time Ms Doe visited the Catherine branch with her two clients, she was told that it wasn't possible to open an account without a scheduled appointment. Yes. Is that the common practice at ANZ branches? Yes. And do you know when that became the common practice? Not exactly, no. Is it relatively recent? <coughs> it would be, yes, more recently. And that rule applies across the entire ANZ network, does it? 
Yes, we've deployed an appointment booking tool to the right. branch network. So it's not open to a customer or a potential customer to walk into an ANZ branch and open an account? There still is an opportunity to walk into the branch to open an account, yes, as long as there's no other appointments booked at that time. I see. Um, and is that an opportunity that can be taken up by ANZ, current ANZ customers only, or can somebody that's not an ANZ customer walk into a branch and open an account? Yes, someone that's not an ANZ customer could. As long as there's no appointments booked at that time, then they will book a walk-in customer in for an, for an appointment to open an account if that's their need. And is part of the reason for that that opening an account with ANZ is a lengthy process? I think that's based on the customer need at the time. Um, well, assume a customer with the need that is <coughs> to open a transaction account of any variety. How long does that process ordinarily take in your experience? Those appointments are normally booked into the calendar for 30 to 60 minutes for an individual <coughs> customer. 30 to 60 minutes? Yes. To open a transaction account? For a new, new customer. For a new customer. How many customers would you expect that a banker in a branch like Catherine would interact with in a day? I'm sorry, I don't know that. Do you have any idea of the number of customers that attend ANZ branches on average in branches in the area that you're responsible for? No, it's not a number I look at. It's not a number you look at? No. The number of attendances by customers into your, the branches that you're responsible for? We look at, we look at, uh, we can, I can look at transaction data, which would show me that, but it's not something I regularly look at, no. I see. Um, Do you, would it be fair to say that a banker in, in a branch like Catherine would deal with uh, more than 10 clients in the course of a day, or I'm customers so, rather? I'm sorry, I, I really, I don't know. Uh, do you know how many people work in the Catherine branch? Yes. How many? Uh, four to five at one time. And how many of those are in roles that deal with client, with customers? They all deal with customers. Right. So some would deal with customers more than others? Uh, there's different accreditation levels as to what branch staff are able to do. Okay. And does that affect the amount of customers that they interact with? Yes, because there'll be some more complex conversations. And you're aware of the role within this branch that the particular banker occupied? Yes. And would somebody with that level of accreditation deal with customers over the full gamut of issues that might arise? Yes. Would you expect that a banker in that role would deal with uh, many customers in the course of a day? Yes. Thank you. The bank was unable to uh, open an account on that first visit and an appoint appointment was then made for the 21st of December. 2017, do yes. you recall that? Yes, I do. And Ms Doe and her two clients attended at the branch on that day? Yes. And you say in your remote community, um, and this is paragraph 84 if it assists you, that uh, the banker conducted an A to Z review. Yes. And that's um, something that I mentioned earlier, the A to Z review. Could you explain what an A to Z review is? <coughs> yes, it's what our bankers will go through uh, with a customer, uh, whether new or existing, uh, to discuss the customer's needs. It's a tool to support uh, a conversation between the banker and the customer. And is it um, mandatory for an A to Z review to be conducted when a new client comes to the bank? It's not mandatory, but ideally, yes. It's one of the th one of the key things that we encourage our staff to do to discuss with customers. When you say encourage, do you mean um, encouraged by ANZ's incentive program? It's, it's part of their performance measures to do a number of reviews, yes. And is, a, is the A to Z review in part a sales tool? It 
It's used, as, as I said, as part of the conversation to understand a customer's need uh, and goal. That might lead to a recommendation which sees, the, which sees a customer have a product fulfilled. All right. And so a customer's need um, is something that might not be readily apparent to the customer. Would that be fair to say? Uh, it would be a stated need and confirmed with the customer. Right. So if a customer came into a branch with the desire to open a bank account, what more would you need to know about the customer's need than that they wanted to open a bank account? Oh, they would un need to understand their name, their address, uh, personal details around email addresses and mobile phone if they have one. This is the type of information that once upon a time would have been completed in an application form? But it, it would depend on the, on the, uh, the account or the product. But now that information is given to the teller who, or sorry, to the banker who inputs it into the computer? The banker will input it into a computer, yes. Yes. And the banker will find out other information from the customer? Yes, I'll inquire to the customer as to why they're here today, why are they in the branch. What other questions will they ask as part of the A to Z review? Well, they would want to understand, it, based on why the customer was there, what were they trying to achieve, what was their goal? Would they um, inquire as to income level? Yes. Uh, and why would income level be relevant to opening an account? It may not be relevant to opening an account. Would they inquire into income level in part because it might identify the need for another product? Or it might identify a need, it might identify the fact that they're on a pension as well. Yes. Um, but might it also identify the need for another product? It would depend on the customer. Uh, if a client came into a branch with a high income and that was something told to the banker in the course of the A to Z review, would that lead to a process that might lead to the banker suggesting a wealth management product, for example? It, again, it would be based on the customer's need and but, confirmed need with the banker. Yes. So that's a need identified by the banker? No. So if a customer came into an A and Z branch um, and had an A to Z conversation with a client and when they went into the branch their sole goal was to open a transaction account, the only product that would be offered to that customer is a transaction account? I'm sorry, it would be a case by case. It would depend on the course of the conversation. Well, on, on my hypothetical example, the person just wants a bank account. That's their need and they happen to have a high income, would you expect that a person in that situation, or un after a proper A to Z review process, might be offered additional products? Again, it would depend on what the customer had stated as a need in, within the conversation. If they'd stated the need was a, a, a transact account, for example, that's, that's what they would walk away with. If during the course of a conversation with any specific customer, there was additional needs confirmed with that customer, they might, they might walk away with something else. All right. You accept at the meeting um, on the 21st of December that the banker opened an Access Advantage account? Yes. In fact, uh, one of the letters you've exhibited to your statement says as much. Yes. The welcome letter. Um, and is an Access Advantage account a standard form of transaction account? It's one of our transaction accounts, yes. It incurs fees? Yes, it does. You understood Ms Doe's evidence to be that her client had incurred significant fees on her transaction account as well as significant ATM fees? I understand that from Ms Doe's statement, yes. Um, and you also understand that the account fees that her clients had incurred on their previous account included significant overdrawn and dishonour fees? I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not quite sure I have seen that, but I, I have cited that. Um, I'm not sure that I understand the difference between seen and cited. Could you take me to the document, sorry, where it says? Yes, I can. Um, I think it might be paragraph six of Ms Doe's statement that's on the screen. <coughs> See, uh, sorry, that's at uh, 0002. 
thank you. Um, can you see about the middle of the paragraph? Amongst other things, Penny could see that our client was incurring substantial ATM fees. This is not uncommon in my client's community because there is only one privately operated ATM. My client was charged a fee every time she took out money or checked her balance at the ATM. My client was also being charged overdrawn and dishonour fees when she did not have enough money in her account to service a direct debit that she had in place. Penny spoke with my client about switching her bank account to a fee-free account. Yes. yes. So you can see now that um, the account fees that Ms Doe's clients had been incurring included, included overdrawn and dishonour fees. Yes, I can see where that's been the case. And they wanted an account that would avoid those fees in the future. Yes, I can see where Penny says that there. Do you think that an access advantage account is an appropriate account for a client in that, for a bank, for a customer in that position? It's not the account we would open for a customer in that position. But it was the account that was opened on this occasion? Yes, and subsequently changed. What is the most appropriate account for somebody in that position? Sorry, in what position? In the position <coughs> of Ms Doe's clients. We have, an, we have a low fee and a no fee account. What's the low fee account? The pensioner advantage. What's the no fee account? The access basic account. Right, and which account would you recommend for clients like Ms Doe's clients? It would come down to a discussion with the customer based on their need. It would be one of those two accounts? Yes, it would. Thank you. Ms Doe says <coughs> that uh, her colleague was told the Access Basic account was not available. I've shown you that already. Yes. And the banker denies making that statement. Yes. Do you accept that a trip from a community, an hour and a half drive out of Catherine to Catherine to speak with a banker would be more memorable to somebody in the position of Ms Doe and her clients than it would be to a banker who's dealing with many customers in the course of a day? That's not a question I can, I can answer. It seemed logical to you that driving an hour and a half to be told something that it might stick in your mind? Again, it's not something I can answer. Are these the sorts of questions that you put to the banker when you had this discussion? Not specifically, no. What did you put to the banker? I made inquiries based on Ms Doe's statement and the banker's recollection of those events. Did you show her Ms Doe's statement? Yes, she has seen. Well, she has seen a um, a previous version of Ms. Doe's. The outline, perhaps the shorter version. The um, yes, the complaint. Yeah. Or oh, the co the complaint that is attached to this statement. Yes. Is that what you mean? Yes. She's seen the complaint. And had she seen the complaint when you first spoke with her? I don't know. Who showed her the complaint? I don't know. Was it you? I have shown her the complaint. I'm not sure that I'm the only person that has shown her the complaint. All right. Had others had discussions with the <coughs> banker before you did about this matter? I don't know. Why don't you know that? About this specific statement? Yes. I'm just trying to get an understanding of the process. You received the compl Ms Doe's complaint either from the Commission or yes. otherwise? Yes. And somebody had a discussion with the banker who was involved because that's the person who knows what went on? Yes. And was that you or was that somebody else? I had a discussion with the, the banker about this 
Yes. And when you spoke with her, did you understand that she had already had discussions with others about this? I, I don't know if she had a discussion with anyone else about this. Did you... Not... Sorry. I don't know. You, you don't know if she had discussed this matter with anybody else? Prior to this, this statement, no, I don't know. Right. Where did you meet with the banker? In Melbourne. Face to face? Yes. All right. And was the reason the banker was in Melbourne to discuss this statement? Yes. And when you met with the banker, it, wa it wasn't known to you whether or not she'd already had discussions with others. <laughs> Uh, not around the statement, no. All right. And um, you don't need to tell me their names, but were there other people involved in the meeting? Yes. Right. And do you recall whether the banker had Ms Doe's complaint at the time of the meeting? I don't recall that. All right. Do you recall referring to Ms Doe's complaint in the course of the meeting? Yes. Okay. Do you recall there being a copy of Ms Doe's complaint at that meeting? Yes. And uh, was there also a copy of Ms Doe's statement? No. It was, do you think that's because it was before Ms Doe's statement was received? Yes. Thank you. And did you ask questions of the banker? Yes. You were the person asking the questions? Yes. All right. And did you ask her questions based on Ms Doe's complaint? Yes. And did you ask her specifically if she said access basic accounts can't be opened by new customers? Sorry, did who say? Did you ask her whether she had said that access basic accounts cannot be opened by new customers? Yes. And what was her response? She said she didn't say that. Right. On that occasion, to Ms Doe? To Ms Doe, sorry. To Ms Doe? Did you ask her whether she said it to Miss Doe or did you ask her if she says it generally? On this occasion. All right, thank you. Do you accept that it might be embarrassing for a banker <coughs> to find out that she had misunderstood the availability of an ANZ product that is sold in branches? Oh, sorry, I missed the start of that. That's all right. Do you accept that it could be embarrassing to a banker to find out that they misunderstood the availability of a product sold within branches? I don't know. You don't know? That's not something I can answer on behalf of a banker. Do you think that if you were called to Melbourne and asked whether or not you'd said something about an ANZ product that was just incorrect, that it would be a bit embarrassing if you had? I can't answer on behalf of the banker. Do you think it's a pretty big deal for somebody who works in an ANZ branch in Catherine to be flown to Melbourne to be asked questions about a particular transaction in the branch? Yes. That would be a very unusual thing, wouldn't it? Yes, it wouldn't be usual. And do you accept that the banker might have some concern about being flown to Melbourne for that type of conversation? I can't answer on behalf of the banker as to their state of mind of being flown to Melbourne. Did the banker not express any concern about being in Melbourne to meet with superiors within the bank? She did express concern, yes. To me personally. Yes. Yes. You've accepted, I think, that irrespective of whatever was said to Ms Doe, the Access Advantage account would not be the right product for people in the position of her clients. Is that correct? Yes. You accept that? And you accept that Access Basic would have been one of the right products? One of the two products, yes. And what was the other one? The Pensioner Advantage. Thank you. The account... Although opened as an access advantage account, 
was then changed to a pensioner advantage account. Do you recall that? Yes. Is the difference between a pensioner advantage account and an access basic account turn largely on whether a customer needs a visa debit card? A visa debit card is one of the differences of the account. What are the other differences? The pension advantage offers uh, its interest bearing and it's also, it also has overdrawn fees and dishonour fees. So why then do you say that a pension or advantage account might be an appropriate product for people in the position of Ms Doe's clients in circumstances where they have previously incurred overdrawn and dishonour fees and were concerned not to continue incurring those fees? Sorry, what was your question then? Why do you say that the pension or advantage account is an appropriate product in circumstances where Ms Doe's clients were concerned to stop incurring overdrawn and dishonour fees? It's one of the two accounts that's offered for people on a pension. Yes, but if you want an account and one of the things that you want to achieve by opening it is not to <coughs> incur dishonour fees and not to incur um, overdrawn fees, then that account doesn't do the job for you, does it? And again, I would say I wasn't in the conversation that day in the branch to understand exactly what was discussed. No, no, no. We've uh, got the two differing I, versions. I, I well understand, Mr Tapsell, that you weren't in the branch. My question is, if you just accept for present purposes that an ANZ, that a customer comes to an ANZ branch and they want an account, they receive Centrelink benefits and they're concerned that their current account with another institution is charging them dishonour fees and overdrawn fees. That's the, that they are the circumstances presented to the banker. If you just accept that. I'm not saying that that's what happened on this occasion for the purpose of this question. I'm saying if you accept that as the position of clients, what is the appropriate bank account that ANZ offers? I would say, again, this is a specific case and, and I wasn't there, so I can't understand exactly what was discussed between these people. I, I've just asked you a hypothetical question twice. I'll, I'll put it to you one more time. If a client comes to an ANZ branch and they say to the banker, I receive a Centrelink benefit and I'm getting killed with overdrawn fees and dishonour fees on my current account, does ANZ have an account for me? What would be the appropriate answer? It would be a discussion with the customer based on some of that is their information. What more would you need to know to determine the appropriate product? If, if they were, as I've mentioned, one of the differences between the accounts is the advantage, pensioner advantage comes with the Visa debit card. Yes. If that is a stated need of the customer at the time, then that may be one of the options that the customer has. <coughs> but you wouldn't solve the problem of dishonour or overdrawn fees, would you? No, not in that case. That would be the difference between the two accounts, as I've highlighted. Are, are you reluctant to recommend ANZ's Access Basic account? No, it, it is based on the customer need and the discussion. Hypothetically, uh, or not, it is still... Uh, it's it's, a, it's a, an account that's available for people in customers that come into our branches uh, it is a fee-free account and is applicable for some people. Commissioner, I apologise. I had not appreciated the time. That might be a convenient point. Uh, 9.30 tomorrow. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Can I ask you to be back in time so that we can begin at 9.30? My apologies, Mr. Tapsell. Costello, just before you begin, there's a matter with which I uh, need to deal. Uh, it will be remembered that on 29 June in Brisbane, there was some discussion uh, about production of some documents by CBA in response to a notice to produce. 
at page 3507 of the transcript and later page 3531, I said that I would consider what course I would take in relation to the matters that had arisen. Page 3536, the transcript records that I said to counsel for CBA that if further investigations were to reveal that some additional change were necessary to reflect the position, I interpolate about when documents were received, I would expect that the solicitor assisting the Commission would be informed of those matters in writing by no later than close of business on Tuesday 3 July. On 3 July, the solicitors for CBA wrote to the solicitor assisting the Commission, and I quote from the letter, to correct two matters and provide some further clarity about the late production of documents, unquote. Having considered what was said in the letter of 3 July, I have asked the solicitor assisting the Commission to seek further explanation from the solicitors for CBA regarding some questions which arise from the terms of their letter. A letter to that effect uh, was sent soon after yesterday's hearings finished. In the circumstances, I am not yet in a position to decide what course I should follow in relation to these matters. Yes, Mr Costello. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Mr Tapitzel, I think you agreed with me yesterday and you say in your witness statement that it was an ANZ Access Advantage account that was initially opened and <coughs> ANZ's records show that an account of that type was opened at 3.03pm. Yes. And the account was changed about an hour later to a Pensioner Advantage account. Yes. And you'll recall Ms Doe's evidence that towards the end of the meeting with the banker, she realised that an Access Advantage account had been opened, raised the issue of fees with the banker and her intention that an Access Basic account was to be opened. Do you recall that? Y yes. Q. Is one way of explaining the change from an Access <coughs> Advantage account to an Access Basic account that the banker initially opened an Access Advantage account, handed the introductory letters which mentioned an Access Advantage account to the clients and then towards the end of the meeting or even shortly after the meeting concluded, changed the account type to a Pensioner Advantage account following the conversation with Ms Doe that I've just outlined. Sorry, you have to repeat the question, Mr Costello. All right. Um, an Access Advantage account was initially opened. Yes. On Ms Doe's evidence towards the end of the meeting, she uh, expressed some concern about that. Yes. She repeated that there was a concern about fees. <coughs> yes. And that the desire had been to open an Access Basic account. Yes. <coughs> ANZ's records show that at 3.03 p.m. an Access Advantage account was opened and at 3.57 p.m. that account was changed to a Pensioner Advantage account. Yes. You think that it's possible that the banker changed the account to a Pensioner Advantage account towards the end of the meeting or shortly after the meeting after Ms Doe had made those statements to her? I, I don't know. Did you ask the banker that when you met with her in Melbourne? If the account was changed. Why the account was changed? Yes. And what did she say? <coughs> He couldn't recall. I see. Would it make sense that it was changed to a Pensioner Advantage account rather than an Access Basic account because a Visa debit card had issued and if it was to be changed to an Access Basic account the Visa debit card would have to be closed and that card would not have to be closed under the Pensioner Advantage account? 
I believe on the banker's version of events, the pensioner ad advantage account was the one that she intended to open off the back of the discussion around the, the Visa debit card uh, during the conversation with the customer. Uh, and so I don't know that, and, and I think that's why it was changed post the initial, I think that she opened it in error. The access advantage account was opened in error? I believe so, yes. And do you accept that if the access advantage account having been opened in error was to be converted to an access basic account, it would have been necessary to cancel the visa debit card? If it was to be changed from an advantage to a basic account, yes. But if it was to be changed from an advantage to a pensioner, sorry, for an access advantage to a pensioner advantage account, there was no need to cancel the debit card? There would be no need, no. Yes, thank you. You'll also recall Ms Doe's evidence that uh, when she asked if the access advantage account was subject to dishonour and overdrawn fees, the banker said that it was, but then said something to the effect of so long as it won't be an issue so long as you don't overdraw the account. That was Ms Doe's version of events. You recall that? Yes. And the banker's version of events was that she suggested that uh, if Ms Doe's clients incurred overdrawn fees, she could contact the banker to have the account changed. Yes. Yes. Do you accept that for a client who's expressed concern about overdrawn fees and is in the process of opening a new account, it's not good enough for the banker to suggest that the customer can wait and see if any charges are incurred and then contact the bank if they are? I'm sorry, Mr Costello, can you re repeat that for me? Yes, I can. Do you accept that for a client who has expressed concern about incurring overdrawn fees and that concern has been raised with the banker, that it is not good enough for the banker to suggest that the customer wait and see if any charges are incurred, and if they are incurred, then contact the bank? Yes, I agree. Thank you. And if Ms Doe's account was correct, and the banker said that it shouldn't be an issue so long as you don't overdraw your account, that was certainly not good enough, was it? No. Thank you. It would be better for the customer if the most appropriate type of account was set up immediately? It would be better for the customer, yes. And that would be even more strongly the case when it's a one and a half hour drive from the community to the branch. <coughs> Yes. Because changing accounts and interacting with the bank is all the more difficult. Yes. The banker also set up a direct debit arrangement to a Progress Saver account that was also set up on that day? No, I don't believe a direct debit arrangement was set up that day. Y you think there was no direct debit arrangement set up? As I recall, no. There wasn't. Right. Thank you. Um, ANZ branch staff are subject to performance measures? Yes. And you give some evidence about that in your witness statement in answer to rubric 413? Yes. Do you recall that? Yes. And branch staff are incentivised to meet their targets? Do you agree that... Sorry, can you repeat that? Yes, do you agree that branch staff are incentivised to meet their targets? Uh, their targets are part of their um, performance measures with which then they may receive an incentive, yes. Thank you. And um, they're judged against various criteria and those criteria are grouped broadly into what are described as pillars. Is that right? Uh, under one specific KRA, yes. What's a KRA? A key result area. Thank you. And one pillar by which performance is measured is called the deposits pillar? Yes. And exhibit TCT 10 to your statement in answer to rubric 413 is a bundle of documents relating to branch performance measures. Can I just show you one of those? It's ANZ.800.638. <coughs> Dot triple zero. Triple zero one, I think, is it? Uh, yes, thank you, Commissioner.
These, this is the document you can see there, 2017 performance measures and uh, management and performance measures, and it says under there, 2H17 updates April 2017. Yes. This is the document that would have applied at the time these accounts were being set up. Is that right? Sorry, just one minute. Are you looking for the hard copy? Yes. Um, can I assist you? It's a large bundle of documents. Does yours have pink pages dividing it? Yes, sorry, I have it now. Thank you. You have it now? Thank you. Uh, is this the document that would have applied at the time these accounts were being set up? No, sorry, it would be the first half 18 documents. The first half 18 document would have applied? Yes, for the account that was set up in December. I see. Um, that's because the first half 18 document took effect in September 2017, is it? October, yes. October. Um, if we move through this document, I think the relevant part is the same in both the 17 and the 18 document. If I'm wrong about that, I'll um, correct it with you soon. Could we move to 0008, please? It's a bit easier to work from this document, Mr Tapsell, because the 18 document has um, some sensitive information in it, whereas this one's historic, so it doesn't. Uh, can you see there, this is product weightings for 2H17, so that's the second half of 17, is that? 2H17? Yes. Okay. And uh, it says here deposits, access sales, access 9% for a banker, 6% for a manager. Could you just ex explain to begin with what this page of this document is doing? Yes. So uh, part of the performance measures for uh, staff members uh, includes two components to their overall balanced scorecard outcome. One of those uh, is the key result areas, of which there's a number of KRAs, sorry, a number of uh, KRAs within that um, KRA side, one of those being the financial KRA. Underneath that, there are a number of pillars, as you've mentioned. Uh, this is the weightings given to a particular pillar under the financial KRA. I see. And so, um, deposits is one pillar. Yes. Is home loans a separate pillar? Y yes, under the financial KRA it is. Yes. yes. And wealth is a separate pillar? Yes. And business, is that a separate pillar? Yes. And borrow lifestyle? Yes, that's a separate, they're all separate. And are, are there five pillars? Yes. In total? That's, that, that represents the whole of the pillars? Under the financial KRA document. Thank you. And the first one under deposits is access sales. And then it says access 9%. What does that mean? So the deposit there for the banker is a total of 30% within that financial KRA. Mm -hmm. The access uh, component of that is weighted at 9%. And access sales means the establishment of new bank accounts, does it? Y yes, one of the th one of the three uh, access products. Which are the three? Uh, access advantage, pensioner advantage, and the access basic. All right, and so that takes nine percent of the of the deposit pillar. Yes. And the access basic account is one of the accounts that counts towards that pillar. Yes, it is. All right, thank you. And what's access quality mean? Oh, that's a measure um, that's utilised when a uh, an access account is open, the quality component is we must have three credits come into that account in the first month. Three deposits? Yes. In the first month? Yes. All right. And then other deposit sales? Uh, other deposit sales is made up of a mixture of, of the sub-pillar you can see there, which is uh, offset account, assured, progress saver, um, and the other, other sub-products there listed. So by establishing um, an access account of any variety and a progress saver account, a banker contributes towards the 
access sales subpillar and the other deposit sales subpillar? Yes, if they open a transaction, an access transact account and a progress save, yes, you, you're correct. All right. Um, and then if we could go to 0049 in that document. This concerns the A to Z review uh, that you and I had some discussion in respect of yesterday. A and Z, the A to Z review is our point of difference. Oh, sorry, do you want to get the hard copy? I'll give you a moment to find that. Thank you. Sorry, is this in the previous, is this in the 17 pack update? Uh, it's in the same document, I think. In the appendices to yes, sorry, that document. That. So I'll just state up front, I don't know if this has changed half to half. Yes. Please. Thank you. Um, so this is the A to Z review, and the A to Z, it, it's described what is the purpose of this objective. Now, when it says this objective, is the A to Z review a measure against which uh, bank branch staff are measured? Yes. Right. And how does that measurement work? The A to Z review fits under the customer pillar. Yes. Within the KRA component of the document. I see. And is it a question of how many A to Z reviews are done? Uh, that, that is one, one component of the measure, yes. Right. So it says there, how is this measured quantity number of A to Z reviews completed? Yes. And that's why it's important for um, an ANZ branch staff member to book a meeting with a client so that they've got sufficient time to meet with them <coughs> to do the A to Z review. I'm sorry, I missed the start of that, Mr Costello. One of the reasons why it's important f for ANZ to book a meeting time with somebody who wants to set up a new account is so that there's sufficient time to conduct the A to Z review? Yes. And that, <coughs> is that the principal reason why you've got the booking system that you now have? Uh, that would be one, one reason for it. The other one is to allow better staff scheduling within the branches as well, to understand the number of appointments through the day to ensure that we have the right people in the branch at the right times of day to see the customers. Yes, I see. And so a, um, a branch staff member uh, who is approached by a customer that wants to open a transaction account is under this policy incentivised to deal with the client at a latter point when a meeting is booked, conduct the A to Z review with them. You agree with that? Sorry, you're going to have to repeat that to me. Customer comes into a branch. Yes. Imagine it's a busy time. Yes. The And the customer wants to open a transaction account. Yes. Under the current, well, at least under this version of ANZ's system, the branch officer was incentivised not to deal with the customer there and then, when there may not have been time to do an A to Z review, but to deal with them at a latter point in time and to conduct the A to Z review. Because a, the number of A to Z reviews conducted by each branch member, oh, sorry, each branch employee counts towards their meeting the customer pillar. That's not the, that would not be the sole purpose of booking an appointment with the customer. No, no, no. My question is not whether that's the purpose. My question is that the branch officer is incentivised to do that because ANZ views A to Z reviews as an important step that ought to be done and incentivises its staff to do them. <coughs> it's a strategic ob objective of the network and yes, we want our staff to do them with our customers and part of one of the KRAs being customer, a portion of that is attributed to the number and quality of the A to Z reviews we do. Yes. So a, an ANZ, a, a person that works in an ANZ branch that sets up two bank accounts, one of which is a progress saver and one of which is an access account, and conduct an, conducts an A to Z review, ticks three boxes for the purpose it's of this contributing, document. It's contributing to their performance, yes. yes thank you. Um, 
that document. Oh, I tender that document, Commissioner. Is it not one of the exhibits? Oh, sorry, yes, it's TCT 10. Thank you. Yes. I don't need to tender it. Um, that document can come off the screen, please. Uh, Mr. Tapsell, do you recall that after the account was set up, there were some telephone calls by Ms. Doe's clients to the ANZ call centre? By Ms. Doe's client, yes. Yes. And have you, uh, you've a, exhibited uh, transcripts that ANZ have had produced of some of those calls. <coughs> have you read those transcripts? <coughs> yes. Do you, I, sorry, do I remember them? Uh, have you read them? I've read them, yes. Do you agree that they are a graphic demonstration of the difficulties that can be encountered by some Indigenous people in dealing with a bank by telephone? Yes, they are. Those calls involved the customer having to undertake a three-hour round trip to a branch to re-verify her identity on two occasions. Do you recall that? Yes, she wasn't able to get her security password. Yes. Correct. Um, Mr Tapsell, did you see any of the evidence on Tuesday morning of the panel? I'm sorry, just a very small amount. All right. Um, and have you had any opportunity to read any of the transcript of that panel discussion? No, I haven't. All right. Um, on Tuesday morning, there was a panel of two witnesses that spoke to various issues faced by uh, some Indigenous people in dealing with financial service entities. And one of the topics that was discussed was how a modified um, approach can assist Indigenous consumers in dealing more effectively with banks. Is that, as an issue, an issue that you have any awareness of? Difficulties faced by Indigenous consumers in dealing with banks? Yes, I'm aware that some Indigenous customers, particularly in remote communities, will struggle with dealing with banks. At from time to time, you can see that through the transcripts. And you're responsible for uh, ANZ's branch network in Northern Queensland and the Northern Territory, and that territory that you're responsible for would include branches that deal uh, to a high degree with Indigenous consumers? Yes. Um, the suggestion by the panellists uh, was that if questions are prepared in a deliberate way, Indigenous consumers are much more likely to be able to interact with a bank successfully by telephone. Is the capacity uh, or, or the, is the need for um, modified sets of questions in telephone banking something that you have encountered in your current role? <coughs> No. All right. Um, Zoe, will I be able to pull up the transcript? Yeah. I, I just want to show you a passage of the transcript of the panel discussion, um, if I may. It's pages 3725 and 3726 of Tuesday's transcript. <coughs> Super quick. Um, You've not seen this before, Mr. Tapsell, but this is some evidence um, given at the, at the second half of page 3725, the first page on the screen there by Mr. Boyle, who um, is an employee of ASIC and is heavily involved in Indigenous consumer engagement with financial services entities. And you can see <coughs> at the last paragraph on page 3725, he says, sometimes we see financial services that entities, I think he means, have policies about the types of questions that are asked, and they can only ask questions in a certain way which might not make sense to an Aboriginal person in a remote <coughs> community. So, for example, one that we come across quite regularly is where we will contact, we'll be assisting somebody to contact a financial services entity, and they will be asked, what is your street address? And in a lot of remote communities, there aren't street names, and the person will say, I don't have a street address or they will be asked three or four times what the street address is, whereas if they were asked what number is on the front of your house, then they can answer that question. It goes on in the next paragraph to say that sometimes the language means that people aren't able to meet the identification requirements. 
And as I said earlier, that often results in, has in the past resulted, we've had specific examples of it, of people failing that identification process and then being told to travel there to their nearest branch. And he then gives an example of Lockhart River, is a community which I come back to again in that circumstance. So the closest bank branch to Lockhart River is in Cairns. And I had a call a couple of years ago from a lady who had lost her bank card, had failed the identification process, and was then told to travel to Cairns to visit her local branch. And it was during the wet season, so the only way that she could get to Cairns was to fly, which was quite expensive, and she was quite distressed when contacted. See that? Yes. Do you accept that the two calls, and if you'd like me to take you to the transcript of them, I will, uh, where Ms Doe's customer failed the identification requirements are examples of precisely the circumstances Mr Boyle is speaking of there? I'm sorry, you will have to take me to them because there's quite a lot of transcripts. All right. Um, I'll, I'll take you to two. The first is uh, TCT26 your witness statement. <coughs> this is ANZ.800.787.00. See, this is a telephone call between a contact centre officer and Ms Doe's client on the 20th of April 2018. Yes. And if um, you'll see at the start there that uh, the ANZ employee answers the phone and Ms Doe's client says, uh, yeah, yes, um, can I transfer the $91, please? Yes. And then if we move across to page 0025, can you see just after halfway down the page, the ANZ employee says, all right, just give me a moment here, okay? For this one, okay, I need to ask questions regarding your account. If I fail to identify you today, you need to step into your branch and just bring photo ID or two forms of ID, and one of those should be a photo ID, OK? See that? Yes. At, which is met with the answer, I haven't got photo ID, sorry. Yes. To which the ANZ employee says, OK. That is if I fail to identify you today, OK? I just need to ask you questions, OK? Yep, OK. Uh, what is your residential address, including state and postcode? Which is met with the address. Yes, your address, including... That's including, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, it's coming to my head. I'm, s I'm sorry, I'm not getting that information. Say that again for me. The complete address and postcode. Sorry. What would be your address and what is your residential address including state and postcode? So address where I'm living? Yes, that's the community. Yes, that's where I'm living, that's the address, just community. What would be the state and postcode? Postcode? Yes. What would be your postcode? What postcode? What state are you, you in in your postcode? See that? Yes. Do you think that's an example of the type of circumstance that Mr Boyle was outlining in the evidence that I just took you to? Yes, it was. And I'll then take you to another transcript which is TCT 28 to your witness statement. It's uh, ANZ.800.780.0062. <coughs> Hi, good afternoon. How can I help you? I want to check my balance in my card, please. I can certainly assist you with that. Can I just please have your first name and your last name, which is given. Thank you so much. Do you have any second name or middle name? And then if we go over the page to 0063, you see 
see there it says, OK, so ma'am, it's fine. Uh, if you haven't, I'm going to have to ask you some questions first. And these questions will be based on certain matters. In the event that I cannot verify you, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to visit any ANZ branch for identification and verification. So can you tell me what's your residential address, including street and postcode? And we're off and running again. See that? Yes. Do you appreciate that for somebody that lives in a remote community that's a three hour round trip to a branch, travelling into a branch to re-verify themselves is a rather more difficult thing than, from some, than for somebody living in an urban area? Yes, if she has to re-verify her ID in this, in this particular customer, yes, it is difficult for her. Yes. And it's plain, isn't it, that the questions that are being asked to her are questions that she's struggling to deal with? Uh, the address one, yes. Yes. Um, this is not an issue that was only encountered by uh, Ms Doe's clients. Other clients of ANZ, sorry, other customers of ANZ have encountered similar difficulties. Are you aware of that? Uh, sorry, I have seen a document here somewhere. Uh, but you would have to take me to it. Yes. Can I please take you to ANZ.800.843.1 Triple zero two is the last number if I only gave three. Thank you. And Mr Tapsell, when you see this document, are you familiar with this form of a docu of document? No, I'm not. Do you know what it is? It, it looks like a, a customer complaint or concern. And it, it would be a complaint or concern that's been logged with ANZ somehow? Yes. All right. Um, and if we could move across to uh, page 0004, please. Can you see in the largest cell on the right-hand <coughs> column, it says branch to load. Do you know what that means? My understanding of that is that the customer has failed their identification and, and has to attend a branch to have themselves re-verified. That's what branch to load means, is it? That's my understanding. Thank you. Yes. Um, Non-ANZ customer called <coughs> to assist with their Indigenous customer in updating his internet banking <coughs> password. Customer was branched to load and non-customer was happy that he was being advised, sorry, was not happy that he was being advised to go into a branch which was over seven hours away. When she asked about alternative ways for her customer to update her password, claims the consultant hung up. <coughs> And then resolution description apologised, however, confirmed that to reset the customer's password, considering they were over 250 kilometres from a branch, was to send in certified copies of 100 points of ID to be mailed with a cover letter confirming new password. You see that? Yes. Does that strike you as an appropriate way to deal with a customer in these circumstances? Sorry, this is a policy from in a complaint from 2014. Yes. Uh, so it was a, before my time in the network, so I can't comment on what the requirements were for a customer then. Um, but to have to travel long distance to verify your ID is, uh, it's not convenient. Do you think that the alternative proposed of sending certified copies of 100 points of ID to be mailed with a cover letter confirming the new password was a sympathetic response? More importantly, was it practical? 
it may not have been practical for a remote customer. No. So what's the solution, Mr Tapsell? Uh, do you agree there's a problem? Uh, then if there is a problem, what's the solution? Uh, for ID and customers, Commissioner, over the, for long distances? Yeah. You know who your customer is. The customers come in to open an account. You know where the customer lives, live on community, long way from the branch. So you've got that data at the point of opening the account. What's the solution then about resolving ID issues uh, in relation to phone banking or other uh, access? So, so this is one where we do have some legislation around it, which is anti-money laundering and, and counter-terrorism funding. So that, that's one concern that we do have in citing or IDing the customer if they do fail their security. Uh, as to a better method of doing it, that, that is something that we've started uh, talking about at very high levels uh, with, a, with another organisation which may prove to be much more convenient for customers living in remote locations. So that's, that's only commenced this, this year though. Well, we know that APRA have um, published guidelines about ID in connection with superannuation, for example and how you meet the 100-point test uh, in those circumstances where you can do it, for example, by uh, letter from uh, an elder uh, in the community. I think that's the central uh, element of the solution there. What's your bank uh, now doing, if anything, about solving what, at least as far as this evidence goes, seems to be a real problem for people who are living remotely. So, at, Commissioner, at point of customer onboarding, the flexibility around ID for Indigenous customers does, does mean we can accept uh, letters from community elders and community ID passes. That's at the onboarding phase. Um, the issue arises around if a customer then may use phone banking and fail their uh, security password or security questions, which is what we've seen in this case, uh, which leads to that inconvenience of having to go back to the branch. Because the security question does not resonate with the customer. The security questions come from a, a list including, you know, what was your first pet and... Uh, uh, who is your best friend in primary school or something like that, doesn't it? There's a broad spectrum and we do allow our customers to pick their own security words. Um, and, that, and then if those are, if they do not verify those over the phone, yes, then they have to attend the branch. That's the piece of work um, that we've initiated to see if there's an easier way with which we can provide that re-identification service rather than a customer have to attend a branch, particularly if it's a long distance away from where they live. Yeah. Uh, Mr Tapsell, a notable example of a bank employing an approach that makes it easier for Indigenous <coughs> consumers to interact by telephone is the CBA's Indigenous Consumer Access Line, or ICAL. <coughs> Are you aware of that initiative? Yes, I am. And when did you become aware of that initiative? Oh, I can't recall exactly, it was, but it's been in the last year, I'd, I'd say. And what do you understand that initiative to be seeking to achieve? Uh, to, make, uh, to make access uh, for remote Indigenous customers easier with their bank. And uh, do you understand that it involves the provision of a specific telephone number f that Indigenous uh, consumers can ring? Yes, I do. And the people that are manning that phone have got particular training in dealing with Indigenous consumers? I don't know that exactly, but I would assume that would be the case, yes. And it employs a specialised identification process so that there is less prospect of lockouts of the type that we've seen happen here occurring. Do you understand that? Uh, sorry, I don't know the detail of it, but... Uh, well, what do you understand the initiative to be directed to? 
Sorry, I understand that that particular initiative is to make it simply the fact that it's to make it easier for Indigenous customers, particularly in remote communities, uh, make it easier for them to connect with their bank. Uh, and easier to identify themselves? I don't know, but that would be one of the things to make it more convenient, yes. And you mentioned that ANZ is undertaking some, I think you described it as high level work on this issue? On the re verification once someone fails. But if a customer opens an account with us up front, at that point, that's the point we do accept more flexible ID from uh, Indigenous customers. Uh, the re-verification is something, yes, that we've only commenced high-level talks on with another organisation. Uh, I think it was early this year. Earlier this year? Yeah, it might, might be late last year, early this is year. Is that something that you're involved with? Uh, I was initially, yes. And um, in ANZ, considering that initiative, has it looked at CBA's ICAL service? I don't know. I, I was only initially involved and I haven't been since. Um, do you think that it would be an assistance to your own branch employees if there was a telephone service that more effectively <coughs> dealt with Indigenous consumers? I think it would make far, I think it would make sense for Indigenous consumers. Yes. Do you think it would make sense for your own branch employees not to be spending time re-verifying people? Yes. And do you know whether ANZ is currently considering anything? equivalent to CBA's ICAL service? I don't know. All right, thank you. Um, just one last thing on uh, Ms Doe's clients. When uh, Ms Doe's clients first contacted the bank, they were, Ms Doe was told that her client should bring two forms of identification to the bank? Yes. And in fact ANZ only require one form of identification if the customer doesn't have photo ID or two forms of secondary identification, is that correct? For Indigenous customers, yes. And were you surprised that a banker, that the banker here based in a location like Catherine was unfamiliar with the flexible identity requirements that ANZ's policies provide for Indigenous consumers? I was surprised it wasn't the key piece mentioned. Based on my discussion with the banker, it was her understanding that those particular cards and letters were harder to get in Catherine, based on her experience. Uh, and that is why she suggested the, the birth certificates which were free at the courthouse, should the person have been born locally. Are ANZ staff that work in locations that have high degrees of contact with um, Indigenous customers given specific training about these matters? Uh, the know your customer onboarding process. Uh, and in particular, the modifications to that process that apply to Indigenous customers? Yes, they do go through training for that. They go through specific training? Yes. Uh, that is. Uh, training directed to those in areas where they're more likely to encounter Indigenous consumers? Across the entire network they do know your customer training? Yes. Uh, my question was slightly different to that. My question was whether, cust whether ANZ employees in locations that are more likely to deal with Indigenous consumers are giving, given any additional training beyond that that every ANZ branch employee receives? No, they're not given any additional training particular to the know your customer outside of their mandatory annual training that they do on top of their initial training. Do you think that's good enough? Uh, I think the training is good enough around the know your customer principles. There are those variations for our Indigenous customers. I don't think it was effective in this matter. I now want to ask you some questions concerning informal overdrafts. Um, an informal overdraft is an arrangement entirely at ANZ's <laughs> discretion? Yes. It allows a customer to go into a debit balance? Based on rules, yes. And within ANZ, informal overdrafts are sometimes referred to as shadow limits? They have been, yes. 
an informal overdraft differs from a formal overdraft in a number of ways. Do you agree with that? Yes. One way is that there is no contractual right in the customer to continue to draw on the account if there's only an informal overdraft. There's no contractual right. No, there's no prior agreement. And so aside, aside from uh, the, the terms and conditions which highlight the informal overdraft may or may not attach to a certain types of transaction accounts in the future. When you say highlight, do you just mean that it states that? It states it in the terms and conditions. Yes, yes, it doesn't highlight it in any way that is different to any other term or condition attaching to no, the account. No, it just it has its own section. It's Thank not you. highlighted. Um, an informal overdraft limit is not fixed and can be changed by the bank without notice? Yes, again, again based on a number of rules. And the customer doesn't know of the limit? No. You say in your witness statement at paragraph 63 that ANZ customers are notified... Which statement, Mr...? Uh, the statement in answer 413, Commissioner. Which is... Triple zero nine. 012 0030. Okay. Paragraph 63. Thank you. <clears throat> um, you've got a hard copy there? Yes, thank you. You see, you say there, ANZ customers are notified of the possible availability of an informal overdraft on transaction accounts in clause 2.19 of the terms and conditions. Yes. And then at paragraph 65, you say, other than the reference in clause 2.19 of the terms and conditions, ANZ does not communicate to its customers when an informal overdraft is attached to an account or for such time that it is, the maximum amount of the credit which it may the maximum amount of the credit which it may from time to time make available. Yes, that's what it says. Right. Some ANZ accounts come with the prospect of an informal overdraft and others do not. Yes. The access advantage account is an account that can have an informal overdraft attached. Yes. In other ANZ accounts, such as the access basic account, cannot have an informal overdraft attached. Yes, that's right. Do you accept that for a person with a low level of financial literacy, the concept of an informal overdraft might be difficult to understand? Yes. Do you accept Mr Bowden's evidence that there are low levels of financial literacy on Groot Island? So I haven't, I haven't seen, I haven't read that in detail, Mr Bowden's uh, witness statement. Uh, though I, I would say that it's a, that's a very broad yes, statement, and, I, and I'd suggest that not all Indigenous people that live on Groot uh, struggle with financial products. But yes, there would be a small subset that would. Yes, and in fairness to you, Mr uh, Bowden's evidence was that there is a range of levels of financial literacy. Yes. Um, and I think that his evidence was the clients that he sees overwhelmingly have <coughs> low levels of financial literacy. Yes, in his role I would understand that to be yes. the case. Um, but do you accept that there are at least uh, material levels of low financial literacy amongst the community on Groot Island? That's not something I can answer. Have you been to Groot Island? Yes. Not something that you've encountered in your dealings on Groot Island? I haven't specifically been to the communities to talk to people about their financial literacy levels, Have no. you spoken to staff in the ANZ branch? Yes. And have they expressed that view to you? It, they, the same thing. It's quite a range of uh, understanding of financial services. Yes. Now, are you familiar with ANZ's terms and conditions on transaction accounts? I'm familiar with it, but I might need to go to it. Yes. You're aware that it's 104... <laughs> Not going to be a memory test. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, <All> Commissioner. Right. <laughs> are you aware that the document exhibited to your statement is 104 pages long? Yes, I am aware. And do you agree that reading the terms and conditions would not tell somebody if an informal overdraft was attached to their account? That's right. It would only tell them that there was a chance 
that an informal overdraft could be attached to particular types of account? Yes. Do you think it's fair to expect customers to read a document of the length and complexity of the terms and conditions in order to ascertain if there is the prospect of an informal overdraft attaching to their account? I understand for people with uh, that may be that may have low financial literacy that that is a difficult prospect. Yes. Well, do you think it might be a difficult prospect for somebody with a high level of financial literacy to wade through 104 pages of terms and conditions to understand if there is even a chance of a particular facility attaching to an account? Yes, that would be difficult. Do you think that the community might expect the bank to be a little more upfront? Yes. And do you accept that the terms and conditions do not contain the relevant charges associated with the use of an overdraft account? Uh, sorry, an informal overdraft or, or a... an informal overdraft? No, they would have to look at the um, the fees document for that. I think the fee. What you might be referring to is a separate book booklet that is described as ANZ Personal Banking Account Fees and Charges. Yes. That and that booklet's referred to in the terms and conditions. I'm sorry, I'd have to go to there. I can't remember that. Would you be surprised if it was not referred to in the terms and conditions? Yes, I would. Yes. Um, and in the terms and conditions, there is a note that the inter interest will be charged on an informal overdraft account at the ANZ retail index rate plus a margin. That's the statement that is given to customers in the terms and conditions? Yes. And then to get more specific information, the customer would need to go to the separate booklet that we've just discussed? Yes. And um, are you prepared to accept from me that that booklet outlines that the margin on an informal overdraft is 8.5 per cent per annum plus ANZ's <laughs> retail rate? Yes. And in your statement, you confirm that the ANZ retail index rate is currently 8.7%? It was at that time, yes. So the, at the time that you made your statement, the interest rate applicable to overdrawn amounts incurred because of an informal overdraft was 17.2% per annum? Yes. Do you accept that it is quite difficult for a customer to ascertain what that rate is? Yes. And in addition to that rate of interest, uh, there are also fees? If you overdraw your account, is what, yes. Yes. Well, you only pay the interest if you overdraw your account, don't you? Yes. And then if you overdraw your account, in addition to the interest, you will also incur a fee? If you overdraw your account by more than $50, yes. Thank you. Um, at Paragraph 68 of your statement, which is on the screen, you say that once the account is overdrawn by $50, a fee of $6 per day is applied for each business day. The account remains overdrawn for a maximum of 10 business days per month? Yes. So in addition to the 17.2% interest charged on the overdrawn amount, a customer might be liable to pay up to $60 a month as a consequence of the informal overdraft? If they, ha if they have an informal overdraft and overdraw their account by more than $50, that is a possibility, yes. And how does the client become aware of that fee? The overdrawn fee, again in the terms and conditions, fees and charges. Um, but you agreed with me earlier, didn't you, that the terms and conditions uh, doesn't outline the dollar amounts of the fees. You've got to go to the separate booklet. You have to go to the fees and charges, yes. All right. Um, I just want to take you briefly to the circumstances of one of the clients of uh, Mr Bowden. I'll take you to a document, ANZ.800.764. Dot three one seven two. 
Can you just open that page on there? Um, will you accept from me, Mr Tapsell, that this is a bank account statement that relates to uh, the ANZ customer described in uh, Mr Bowden's evidence as client one? It's been redacted for reasons of confidentiality, but this is an account that relates to that person. Okay. This is an account statement for an account of that person. Uh, and could I take you please to page 3185 of that bundle? So is this, the, this is the standard front page of an ANZ statement? Yes. All right. You see the opening balance, total deposits, total withdrawals, closing balance. And if we go over the page, can you see there on the 13th of September and again on the 8th of November there is a Centrelink pension deposit? Yes. The person who is receiving uh, Centrelink benefits. And then if we go over the page, <coughs> see on the 14th of November, overdrawn fee? Yes. $6? Yes. 15th of November, overdrawn fee? $6? 16th of November, overdrawn fee? $6? Yes. 17th of November overdrawn fee $6? Yes. No charge on the 18th or 19th of November because they were Saturdays and Sundays and the terms and conditions that I just took you to showed that overdrawn fees are charged on business days? Yes. 20th of November overdrawn fee $6? Yes. 21st of November overdrawn fee $6? And then on the 22nd of November there is a credit from Centrelink. Yes. However, there are a number of withdrawals on that day. And on the 23rd of November, there is another overdrawn fee of $6. Yes. And again on the 24th of November. Yes. Then we have another weekend. On the 27th of November, there is another overdrawn fee with a $6 charge over the page. See that overdrawn fee there, 27 November? Yes. So on my count, Mr Bowden, that's nine overdrawn fees within a two-week period. Nine sixes are 54, which means it's within the $60 maximum limit that will be charged in overdrawn fees for an informal overdraft account in a month. Sorry, can you put that to me again? Um, you understand that there's a $60 cap on overdrawn fees? That's how I understand For informal it. overdrafts? Yes. And all, all I'm putting to you is I've just shown you nine fees charged in a two-week period, which means that this is under the cap. Yes, that's the overdrawn fee, yes. Yes, yes. So there's been $54 in overdrawn fees charged in this two-month period and when a two-week period. We're now at the end of the month. Yes. Good. Um, could we then please go to 3192 of that document? <coughs> See, this is an access advantage account statement. This is the same account statement. And there is a summary, a fee summary here. And you'll see um, it's fees charged for the period 13 to September to 12 October. Can you see that? Oh, sorry, which? Yes, I can see. Sorry, I can see that. So this is a period before the period that um, I just showed you. But my question is, <coughs> on a fee summary like this, would <coughs> overdrawn fees appear? This, 
I'm sorry, I don't know from my own experience, but is there a separate page for additional fees? This looks like the service fee page. If that page could just be um, zoomed out a little. So it starts with service fees at the top there, monthly account service fee. Yes. Then another monthly account service fee. See how it states monthly account service fee fee charge 13 October to 10 November. Yes, and then I can 11 see. November to 12 December. So that's in the period that I was just taking you to. And then if we go over the page. There's transaction fees. They're the service fees also. Sorry, do I have a hard copy of this? You don't. Um, I just want to show, I'll show you one more page of that. If we go back to 3191. See at the bottom of the page there, it says this statement includes ANZ bank charges $90. I'm going to go hard copies just been made available. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah sorry, I can see that, Mr Costello. The, the bank charges at the bottom. Yeah. There. Why? Th those bank charges include the $6 overdrawn fees that I've just taken you to? I'm sorry, I don't know. Well, you've got copies of the statement there. Why don't you interrogate the statement and let me know if you think that they're included in that $90 or not. I'll just give you a moment. Mr Costello, I'd have to go through the entire statement, I'm sorry. All right. So you don't know whether or not the ANZ bank charges component at the foot of that page includes the overdrawn fees? I don't know. All right. But do you agree with me that the overdrawn fees do not appear <coughs> on either of the two pages that I just showed you that are headed fee summary? Yes, that was just the service fees listed. Why would the overdrawn fees not appear in the document in the part of the document that is entitled Fee Summary? I don't know. Do you think that that would be confusing to a consumer? It, it may be confusing to a consumer, yes. It appears to be confusing to you, Mr Tapsell. Yes, it's not listed in that on that service fee page, I understand that. It is listed within the statement, as you've pointed out, at well, the bottom of the page. You've yeah. just said to me you're not sure if it's included in that amount. And that's right, I'm not sure. Right. So how would a consumer be sure about that fact? I, I can't answer that. I don't know. You accept that it would be very difficult for a consumer to understand, based on a summary amount, what they've been charged by ANZ as this statement is formatted? I'd suggest that something called ANZ bank charges might, might be an indicator of something that I'd been charged fees for something. Yes. And you might also think that something described as an overdrawn fee is a fee. Yes. And you might think that a fee would appear in the part of the document that is entitled Fee Summary. Yes. That would be a reasonable assumption, wouldn't it? Yes. And you agree with me that whether or not the overdrawn fees are included in the ANZ bank charges amount, they are not included in the Fee Summary portion of the statement. Yes, I agree that the bank charges amount there isn't in the fee portion of this statement. Yes, thank you. ANZ, that statement can... Uh, oh, I tend to that document. Just before it... Well, uh, is it not in evidence already? No. Um, a statement relating to uh, 
ANZ client identified by Mr. Bowden <coughs> as client one. Uh, ANZ 800 764 uh, becomes exhibit 4.208. Just before it comes down, though, uh, too late, uh, he said. Uh, Mr. Tapsell, uh, I know all you've seen about this client's financial affairs is a few pages of one bank statement. Yes, Commissioner. Based only on those few pages of that bank statement, if that client came into a branch at, you, at which you were the relevant lending officer and asked you for an overdraft, what would your answer be? Uh, it is, so, sorry, Commissioner, it is very hard to tell just from a couple of uh, statement pages about the, this particular customer's financial um, needs or, or requirements, uh, understanding that uh, I, I would have to sit down with him and discuss this with him. It's very hard just to look at it and sum up his position from a, a few statements. And if this is the sum total of this customer's uh, financial affairs, Dental ink coming in, money going out, as recorded uh, on this statement. Would you give this customer an overdraft? Uh, no. And yet ANZ does without the customer asking. Uh, in this case, it looks like there is an informal overdraft attached to this account. Yes, Commissioner. And it, I suspect it's a matter for... Uh, the lawyers to grapple with later, Mr. Tapsell, rather than f with you. But um, if you have uh, a comment on it that you feel you can offer, feel free to offer it. Uh, isn't there a tension between giving clients informal overdrafts when if they applied for the overdraft, you'd say no. I think there is a tension there, Commissioner. And no. how that tension plays out as a matter of law is not something I'm going to ask you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Well, I can. <laughs> no, I don't think I'd be very helpful there, Commissioner. <laughs> but um, how it plays out through the, uh, the Credit Act is something that no doubt ANZ will uh, spend some time telling me later in the piece. But uh, I just, it, it struck me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there is a tension between uh, giving unasked an overdraft to a customer, when if the customer asked, you'd say no. And I think you agree that there is a tension there. In this case, Commissioner, yes, I think there, yes. is, a, there is a tension. Yes, Mr Costello. Mr Tapsell, ANZ customers living in high risk zones are not entitled to informal overdrafts, are they? Uh, no. And high risk zones are areas with a higher risk of mortgage default because of the presence of or closure of a mine? Yes. It's got nothing to do with the socio-economic circumstances of people living in that area. No, it's based on the mortgage lending. High risk zones are a reflection of the potential credit risk to ANZ. Yes. Because in particular areas affected by mining, there can be fluctuations. Yes. And ANZ restricts access to informal overdrafts in those areas because of the risk that ANZ will be left chasing an overdrawn balance. There is a, there is a, there's been a conscious decision made not to uh, apply informal overdrafts in high risk areas. And ANZ has not made an equivalent decision in respect of people in receipt of Centrelink benefits it has. It has? Yes. 
that's a <coughs> it's that's a recent change that's been implemented. All right. Um, do you, can you explain that change? Yes, Mr. Costello. The um, so there's a, num a large number of rules which apply to the informal overdraft process. Uh, those rules uh, went through a review commencing about a year ago. Uh, off, the back, off the back of those reviews, there's been ongoing changes to the rules and how they apply to certain accounts uh, and, and customer behaviour, uh, including receiving um, Centrelink payments or a percentage of their Centrelink payments, uh, a percentage of their income is Centrelink payments. Uh, so that's been an evolving process uh, which has happened for the last year, the, the additional rules which have been applied to informal overdrafts. And are those rules now being applied? Yes. And how do those rules work in terms of excluding informal overdrafts for people on Centrelink benefits? Does it mean that a person on a Centrelink benefit is automatically ineligible? Sorry, I'll need to go and look at the specific rule. Right. In there because there's a larger number. Uh, and I know there's a Centrelink specific rule, but I don't know uh, the exact nature of that rule. And uh, as a consequence of that change to the rules, it is no longer the case that it's only ANZ customers living in high risk zones that will fall into mand mandatory exclusion? Sorry, you need to repeat that. As a result of the rule changes that you've just described, yes, people other than people living in the high risk zones will not be entitled to an informal overdraft. Potentially, there's a large amount of rules, so it's not just there's not just a high risk mining zone rule. Um, there's a large there's, there's a, a, a page of rules which apply to accounts that may have an informal overdraft attached including rules around the customer behaviour, uh, account behaviour, um, where the customer lives, the payments they're receiving. Uh, th there's a number of rules. Do you think that it accords with community standards and expectations to allow an informal overdraft to be habitually used by a low income earner? Sorry, can you, you'll have to repeat that. Do you think that it accords with community standards and expectations to allow an informal overdraft to be habitually used by a low income earner? Do I think the community would accept that? Is that your question? Do, do you think that, the commun that it would accord with community standards and expectations to allow a low income person to regularly overdraw their account. I, think I object, Commissioner. The evidence doesn't establish uh, ha allowing habitual use of informal overdrafts by low-income earners. What has been put to Mr Tapsell is a, a two-week period in, in one client's I'm sorry. statement. What, what's, what's the proposition, Ms Williams? I'm not following that at all. Go on. What is it? The, the proposition that has been put to Mr Tapsell, as I understand it, uh, is whether it, has, whether, it, whether it is fair uh, or the community would expect that ANZ would permit a customer to, on a low income to habitually use an informal overdraft. But all that's been shown to Mr Tapsell by way of evidence is, is a, a two week period from one client's bank statement. And my submission is that the evidence doesn't establish uh, permission, permission of habitual use of overdrafts by low income earners. Well, Mr Costello. No, I might the question slightly differently. I've seen the statements of account uh, in relation to client one, as it was described by yes. Odin, um, and you saw at the front of the document the um, starting balance at the start of the account of the period that the uh, statements concern and the closing balance. Do you remember seeing that? Sorry, I don't. Could we go to the first page, please, of that document? See the opening balance is $2.74? Yes. See at the foot of the page it says totals at the 
end of page, three dollars thirty-four. Yes. And I think that on <coughs> and a, a page that I took you to earlier that I set and I asked you, is this the ordinary front page of an ANZ account? And you said yes. And it showed an opening balance of around two dollars and a closing balance of around two dollars at the end of the statement period. Do you remember that? Yes. All right. Now, I think the point Ms Williams was uh, making, as I understood it at least, was that this is somehow a rare and unusual circumstance yes. reflected uh, in this uh, uh, set of statements. Is it rare and unusual, uh, Mr Tapsell, for Centrelink benefit uh, recipients to uh, 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 find that uh, expenditure equals income uh, much more often than not? It's, it, Commissioner, that's a very uh, wide-ranging number of people, obviously. But yes, they do live payment to payment more so, from what I've seen in my inquiries, than people not on Centrelink. The fact is, most Centrelink beneficiaries, uh, at least with many kinds of benefit, would be living uh, within the limits of their benefit uh, from week to week, would they not? From what I've cited in my inquiries, Commissioner, yes. Yeah. Yes, go on. And Mr Tapsell, it's the case that until the recent changes, a person receiving a Centrelink benefit was not, manda was not subject to a mandatory exclusion from an informal overdraft. Now, as I've mentioned, there, there, there's a, an, a large amount of rules. They may have hit one of those other rules. They may have had an account that wasn't able to have an informal overdraft attached. But they were not excluded by reason of the fact that they received Centrelink benefits. Again, I'd have to go to the document and see exactly uh, the rules that which may have applied specifically to Pen um, Centrelink. Did you understand when you made your statement that Centrelink, somebody who receives a Centrelink benefit is automatically excluded from receiving an informal overdraft? Uh, if that specific scenario, uh, I, I wasn't aware if that was an a specific scenario that was in play at the moment. Well, what I've just shown you from these statements demonstrates that at least at the point in time that these statements relate to it plainly wasn't the case, doesn't it? I've taken you to deposits from Centrelink in this account and I've shown you the overdrawn statement fees. Yes. So at least at this point in time there was not a mandatory exclusion from an informal overdraft for somebody receiving a Centrelink benefit. Do you accept that? Yes. And was your evidence earlier that there have been recent changes relating to exclusion of people receiving Centrelink benefits from yes. informal overdrafts? Yes. And that's a recent change? That's a recent change, yes. And why was that change made? Uh, as I mentioned, there's been, a, for the last year, an ongoing review of the rules which apply to informal overdrafts. Uh, and there's, there's a large amount that have been uh, implemented and planned to be implemented uh, in the next... Well, it, some of it, yeah, in the, in the next period, so fr from the last year through to the, uh, I think September's the next deployment that I've seen listed around new rules coming in again. So it's been an ongoing process for the last year of um, adding additional rules. So as you sit here now, are you able to say whether or not a mandatory exclusion applies to somebody who receives Centrelink benefits? And, and sorry, as I've mentioned, Mr Costello, there is a, it's a specific line, it's a specific rule. Uh, I'm not sure if it's just, a, if it's relating to a percentage of a Centrelink payment or an entire Centrelink payment. But there is a, other additional rules which may apply Thank well. you. Um, and it's certainly not the case that, uh, the op that there is an opt-in arrangement to an informal overdraft. Not to my knowledge, there is a form that we can fill out for a customer um, if they have the potential for an informal overdraft, which will stop the informal overdraft being attached to the account. Well, that's the opposite, isn't it? That's opting out. Yes. It's not the case ever 
that a client opts into an informal overdraft, is it? If they meet the exclusionary rules and they have that particular type of account, per the terms and conditions, they may have an informal overdraft attached to their account. Because they've asked for it? No. When I say opt in, just perhaps I'm not being clear, I mean an act of choice by the customer to have an informal overdraft. Uh, there's not a specific upfront question around would you like one or not? On every occasion it is a matter entirely within the discretion of ANZ. Uh, at, the, at the beginning of opening the account, yes. Unless the client opts out? Yes. And at the time you made your statement, your first statement, you thought the only way a client could opt out is by completing a form? Yes. And you subsequently have ascertained that there are other ways that a client can opt out, is that right? I'm sorry, what are you referring to? I'm referring to your supplementary statement where you say that it's also possible for a client to opt out by going into a branch or by telephone. Do you recall that? Y yes, and that's, that's to complete the form. Yes. Sorry, what's completing the form? The customer, if they attend the branch or contact the con co contact centre, they can choose to opt out. By completing the form? Yes, or requesting it over the phone. Right. But at the time you made your first statement, you thought the only way that an informal overdraft could be uh, switched off is by the customer completing the form. Is that correct? Sorry, I can't recall. Um, I won't bring it up on the screen, but at paragraph 17 of your supplementary statement, you point out that you, in your earlier statement you explained that a customer may take up the option of switching off their ability to informally overdraw, and that could be done by completing the form request to restrict informal overdraft facility bracket DIBS close bracket and you had exhibited one of those forms yes. to your earlier statement. And then you say a customer may also request any informal overdraft on their account be removed over the telephone while speaking to one of ANZ's contact centre staff after having securely confirmed their identification. Yes. And we've already spoken today about some of the difficulties secure, securing, uh, securely confirming identification can cause for some consumers. Uh, for some consumers, yes. That... And then you say additionally ANZ may arrange for an informal overdraft to be switched off independently without any request. And that's a reflection of the fact that these informal overdrafts are within ANZ's discretion. Yes, unless the customer asks for it to be switched off. And at the time you made your first statement, you didn't know that an informal overdraft could be switched off by the telephone. Uh, if it wasn't in my statement, that's correct. And do you recall making inquiries about how to turn these things off? Uh, I made inquiries as to the uh, branch component. I had not made inquiries into the contact centre at that stage. This is subsequently why we've uh, ha why I've added the supplementary statement. All right. Um, are you familiar with the document described as a code of operation? Yes. This is a code that relates to what are sometimes described as the 90% arrangements? Yes. And do you understand that the 90% arrangements are arrangements whereby a uh, recipient of certain benefits, including Centrelink benefits, is entitled to have access to 90% of that amount and only 10% can be applied towards a bank debt? Yes. That's your general understanding of it? Y yes, we, uh, through the ABA we've signed up uh, as an organisation to put in place, uh, well, abide by the code of practice um, which is based on best practice in that um, segment. And you say in your statement that if a customer overdraws their account they can visit an ANZ branch or agency and request that the 90% arrangements be put into place? Yes. Is it your understanding that the onus is on the customer to initiate the request to put the 90% arrangements into place? Yes. And um, that's confirmed by a document that I'll show you here, ANZ.800.636.02.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0
Now, as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, this is a flow chart for the operation of the code of operation. My, my, if my memory serves me correctly, Mr Costello, I think this is a draft document. Right. Was it finalised, do you know? I don't know. And why do you think this one's a draft? I, I, I think I recall citing that somewhere within the documentation we've provided. The fact that it is a draft? That, that's what you cited? That's my understanding, yes, from what I recall. All right. And do you, at, at least um, so far as your evidence has been just now, you say that the code of operation is applied if the customer requests it. And that is confirmed, at least in this version of this document, in the very first um, box on the left-hand side where it says Centrelink slash DVA customer becomes overdrawn and makes contact with the bank. Yes. So the starting point is that it, the cut, it is for the customer to make contact. Yes, in this document, yes. And is it your understanding that if a customer has another source of income other than Centrelink, they aren't eligible for the 90% arrangements? No, they still are on their Centrelink payment. So that portion of their payment, yes. It will apply, but it will only apply to the Centrelink portion. Income, thank you. Um, you have annexed the code of operation to your statement at TCT 17. I just want to take you to it briefly. It is ANZ.800.643.044. Oh, um, Commissioner, perhaps I should tend to that flowchart before I move to the next document. Draft flowchart for code of operation ANZ 800 exhibit 4.209. Mr Tapsell, have you read this document before? Yes. If we move to page two of the document at 0442. See at the top it's a non-legally binding statement of best practice. Yes. And the code applies to the recovery of debts that arise from customers' overdrawn accounts where no repayment arrangement already exists. Yes. And the code does not apply where it would conflict with any conditions agreed between the customer and the ADI. Yes. And then under purpose of the code, it says, all parties recognise that the Australian Government provides payments to customers to ensure they are able to provide basic food and accommodation for themselves and their families. The aim of this code is to ensure that recipients of income support payments and DVA payments have sufficient income to maintain adequate food and shelter. Participating ADIs agree that they will take this into account when considering the amount they should recover each fortnight for the repayment of the debt. See that? Yes, yes. And then um, if you skip the next paragraph and go to the paragraph after that, under this code the default position is that a customer should be able to retain at least 90% of their income support payment or DVA payment in any fortnightly period. See that? Yes, I do. Do you see that it says the default position is that the customer should be able to retain? Yes. Do you think that this being the default position is consistent with ANZ only applying the code if the customer initiates the contact? No, we don't meet the best practice here. You agree with that? Yes. And why don't you? Uh, I don't know. There's, there's many different teams within the organisation that uh, deal with this and it's not something, as I've mentioned, that we are meeting best practice on. Have you made inquiries about why that is the case in the course of preparing to give your evidence to the Commission? Yes. And what did those inquiries reveal? Uh, nothing substantial that I'd want to mention here, uh, as in there's still... 
Uh, this, I've still got outstanding questions which weren't able to be settled in time for me to make a, a truthful statement here today about our, what we are doing within the, the code of practice. Do you think that it's good enough for a bank the size of ANZ to enter into a code of operation like this but then not apply it to its terms? Uh, as I've mentioned, I, we, I don't think we do hit the aim of the, of the code and the purpose of the code uh, around the best practice. We do rely on the customer. And my question was, is that good enough? Uh, as it relates to this code, no. You think that the community would expect that ANZ would adhere to a code that it has bound itself to? Uh, I would expect, yes, the community would. And you accept that as the code sets out, the purpose of Centrelink payments is to be able to provide basic food and accommodation for the recipients of it? I read you that paragraph. Yes. That's the purpose. That's the purpose, yes. And that's an important purpose. Yes. And its importance is recognised by the fact that this code has been agreed. Yes. And do you think that it's good enough for ANZ not to act in accordance with the code given the important purpose that those payments are made for? Yes, as I mentioned, we rely on the customer to do it and we are not meeting best practice in this code. Yes, and is that good enough? Uh, n n not for these customers that will be impacting. And are you aware of ANZ making any steps to enforce the code in accordance with its terms? Yes, I, yes, I understand there to be uh, work effort underway now to see how we're actually able to do this in a less manual way. And when will that be done? I don't have an answer for you on that here today. Have you sought an answer? Yes. And what were you told? It needs to go through a planning phase. And has that planning phase commenced? Uh, I understand uh, as of earlier this week that there are uh, discussions underway. So for me, I sh my assumption is there that when I leave here, I can follow up with that to ensure that planning is up commencing around how we meet this best practice. Do you think that the operation of something like the code of operation is particularly important in circumstances where a client has an informal overdraft account that incurs significant fees? As I've mentioned, yes, this code is important and we aren't abiding by the best practice rules within it. So it's important to all customers. But do you think it's particularly important to a customer incurring a high level of fees? I think it's important to all customers that are receiving a pension payment My and are over and in an overdrawn position. But a customer incurring a high level of fees is more likely to lose a greater portion of their Centrelink payment to the fees. Potentially, yes. And an informal overdraft is a facility that incurs high fees. If it's utilised, then it may be incurring fees for the customer, yes. And would you agree that those fees are high? I can't answer that. I don't know. Well, Mr Tapsell, you're a banker. Do you think that it's expensive credit to pay a maximum of $60 a month on amounts over $50 that are drawn plus 17.8% interest? Again, it's a customer by customer position and whether they utilise the, the overdraft and become overdrawn, uh, they will pay the fees. I don't know how the fees are derived. Do you have an understanding of the prevailing interest rate for a formal overdraft? Uh, no, I don't. No idea? No, I don't. Would you agree with me that somebody utilising a formal overdraft doesn't incur a fee for overdrawing their account up to the limit of the overdraft? Yes, that's right. So they wouldn't incur the equivalent of up to a maximum of $60 a month for drawing within their overdraft limit? No. So at least on that basis, an informal overdraft is a more expensive type of facility than a formal overdraft? On that basis, yes. And would you expect that the prevailing interest rate on a formal overdraft would be lower or higher than in respect of an informal overdraft? I don't know what that rate is. You don't have a view about whether or not it would likely be higher or lower than the prevailing rate for an informal overdraft? Sorry, I don't know. All right. You've included some figures in your statement about the income earned by ANZ 
in respect of overdrawn fees and interest on overdrawn amounts. Have you made any inquiries about the extent of fees charged to customers on Groot Island? Sorry, I'd, I'd have to review my statement. It's not, it's not in your statement specifically. It's just uh, that one figure. That's right. You've given one figure, I think, in respect of the Northern Territory, is my recollection. Yes. Have you personally made any inquiries about the amount of interest charged or fees charged to customers on Groot Island as a result of informal overdrafts? No. Were you concerned when you read the documents provided to you by the Commission about informal overdrafts on Groot Island? This particular statement? Mr Bowden's statement, for example. W was I concerned? Were you concerned that ANZ customers were making use of a facility that might not be appropriate to their circumstances and that it was costing them money? I, I would be concerned about that, yes. You would be or you were? I haven't gone through these accounts in detail and I don't know how far back they go. Uh, but yes, if, if a customer is, in a, is not in an account that they... Uh, not in the best account for them and, and because of that it's costing them money, that is something I would be concerned about. And do you agree with me that the code of operation is a difficult arrangement for a bank to implement? I can't answer that. I only see what we have in place today. Yes. Where it hasn't been best practice, as I've mentioned. In fairness to you, Mr Tapsell, it strikes me that it might be difficult to implement the code of practice because it applies only in respect to Centrelink payments, which might be only one form of income. Yes, that's, that's right. And so one form of income will be subject to the arrangements and the other won't. Yes. And the client needs to be provided with the ability to, ability to continue to draw funds from the account, even though the account might in fact be overdrawn. Because yes. only 10% of that income can be applied. And that, is that a complicated arrangement for a bank to put in place? Uh, I don't know, but I would make an assumption that it could be. You agree it would just be easier if people were in an account, like an access basic account, that did not have an informal overdraft attached to it? Uh, for their particular circumstance, c certain customers, yes, that might be it. Part of, part of the uh, transaction account um, that we, ha that we offer offers choice. And so, it, f for me, this is, this is something I grapple with. There's a customer on Centrelink, for example, in, the, in some of these cases and what we've seen here, uh, should we only be saying you can have an access basic account? Or should we be saying, based on your needs and what, what you would like, here's some other options for you as well? Uh, that for me is a, a dilemma. How do we best offer options and support a customer to, in this case, in the 90% arrangement, how do we actually put that in place for the customer uh, ahead of doing it retrospectively. So, so that, that's an issue that I, I have said is an issue with us. Uh, but again, back to the, your question on the basic account, in some cases it will be the best account, yes. In other cases where a customer might want choice, uh, you know, that's something we would also have to abide by considering their circumstances. Yes. Um, ANZ's concern to ensure that its customers are entitled to make a choice of the account? Yes, the customer should be entitled to make a choice. Yes, and should they be entitled to choose whether or not an informal overdraft is applied to the account before it's applied? Sorry, I, that's, I, I don't, I can't answer that, I don't know, it's not my product. You don't have an opinion? No. All right. Um, do you think ANZ does enough to promote its access basic account? Uh, it, it has the same promotion on the website in branch as, as the other accounts, yes. It has, all accounts are promoted equally? Uh, so I don't know, that might change from time to time. The way we might market things from time to time might change. So places on anz.com, for example, uh, one, you know, one, that will change over time and 
uh, but information is equally available on website in branch on all the transaction accounts. Yes. Um, do you think that perhaps more could be done to promote the Access Basic account in areas of need? Uh, we would do that via the review process. Uh, aside, out with the customer, and aside from just marketing basic accounts, uh, perhaps that is something we could do. We could talk more about those in certain areas. Do you think it would be good to help your customers into an account that, if the circumstances happen to be, would be beneficial to them? As I mentioned, yes, ideally yes, but there is also a choice to consider. Yes. Um, Mr Tapsell, are you aware of how many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are employed across the branches that you're responsible for? Yes, it's the people that have um, self-identified uh, um, is about 30. And are any of those people on Groot Island? No. Um, are any of those people in the Catherine branch? Uh, we have a trainee in Catherine branch. And do you think that one way that the bank could assist its Indigenous clients would be to have more Indigenous people working in branches? Mr Costello, we need to service a wide variety of customers, obviously. Yes. Uh, and, and so with that, in some cases, yes, that will be the case. In the more remote areas, that's, a, that's a, the best option. Uh, unfortunately, trying also to recruit can be difficult. Yes. Um, we do have a number of traineeships and uh, another school-based trainees we, we mentioned, which is the kids are still at school and they come and work with us uh, a day a week. Um, it would be ideal uh, to execute as a little bit more difficult. Would it be ideal in a location like Groot Island that's quite remote, has a high degree of it's got a very broad, customers? It's got a very broad group of people that live and work there. Um, I don't know that that would benefit necessarily uh, in the current circumstances from what I've seen. It would be ideal as to whether uh, we can execute that. Um, that's another matter. But you think it might be beneficial if, if you could execute it? Well, well, it may be, but in saying that also, the staff that are at, on Groot have lived in that community for five, eight and ten years. So they have experience in dealing with Indigenous customers from remote locations. Thank you, Mr Tapsell. Commissioner, I have no further questions. Thank you. Yes, Ms Williams. Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> Mr Tapsell, you were, um, let's put you at transcript uh, 4072 at about line 39. <coughs> Question, uh, put some questions whether uh, the fees and charges booklets are referred to in ANZ's account terms and conditions. Can I just clarify that matter? If you could turn please to exhibit TCT 11 of your uh, exhibit to your rubric 413 statement, please. I'm sorry, I should have given the reference number for the screen. It's ANZ.800.634.1128. Uh, and uh, now that you have that document, Mr Tapsell, could you turn please to page 1129? Yes. Are you able to, I, having refreshed your memory by looking to that page, are you able to refresh your, are you able to identify the, whether the fees and, the terms and conditions booklet uh, refers to the fees and charges booklet? Yes, it does. Thank you, Mr Tapsell. Uh, uh, Mr Tapsell, at transcript page 4077, you are asked some questions starting from line nine by the uh, commissioner concerning the account statements of client one to which council assisting uh, took you. Uh, if those account statements could be brought up on the screen, please. Uh, ANZ.800.634.1128. 
3172. And at line 21 of the transcript of page 4077, uh, you were asked a question about whether uh, the sum total of this particular customer's financial affairs being Centrelink coming in and money going out, uh, if that was the sum total, would you give this customer an overdraft? Uh, could you have a look, please, at uh, page 3172 that is on the screen? And if I can just direct your attention to a couple of uh, transactions shown on the account statement. Could you look please at the transaction for the 19th of December on page 3172, which is labelled a transfer? Yes. Um, I'm sorry Mr Tapsell, I see that from what you can see on the screen you can't see the identity of, um, uh, of where the transfer comes from. Um, I think you were provided with a hard copy of the uh, oh, sorry. Yes, I was. statement. Uh, does that statement have the uh, identity of the payer of the transfer redacted, Mr Tapsell? Sorry, what was the page number at the top, ANZ? Uh, page 3172. It should be the first page of the document that you have, is it? Yes. Uh, is the identity of the... Uh, transfer payment on the 19th of December on that page redacted and marked confidential? Yes. I see. All right. I, I won't pursue that now and I'll uh, make I'm, a... I'm sorry. What, what was your question there? Sorry. My, my question is simply, are you able to see whether or not the transfer on the 19th of December on page 3172 is a Centrelink transfer or some other transfer? Please don't say the name of the transfer or if you can see it. It's, it's not a Centrelink transfer, it's some other transfer. Thank you. Uh, and if you could also uh, turn, please, um, by way of example, to page uh, 3187. Could you look at the transfer dated the 15th of November on that page? Was that 3187? Sorry, that page. Yes, Mr. Tapsell. Oh, sorry. That's all right, take your time. The document provided to you isn't stapled, it makes it difficult. Yes, I have that. Uh, so for the transfer of the 15th of November at page 3187, are you able to say if that's a Centrelink transfer or not? That's not a Centrelink transfer, that's some other transfer. Thank you. Could you have a look at page 3188, please? Yes. By way of example, could you look at the transfer for the 15th of December on page 3188? Yes. Is that a Centrelink transfer, Mr Taps, or some other transfer? It's some other transfer. Uh, would those non-Centrelink transfers be relevant, in your opinion, uh, to any discussion, uh, any decision whether to grant this particular customer an informal overdraft. Yes, they would contribute to an apple. Sorry, an informal overdraft. Did you say? Uh, informal or formal, Mr. Tapsell. Uh, yes, they would. They would have an impact on. Uh... Well, do you want to change the answer you gave me? Would you give this client an overdraft if the client asked it? Based on these 
payments, Commissioner, there would be an assessment process. I would put this customer through, yes. You were able to offer an opinion about whether you'd given an overdraft to this client or not, if the client asked for it. Commissioner, I'm not appearing to be unhelpful, but there would be a number of factors that would have to go into uh, the discussion with this customer to understand if it was applicable for him first, before I would put him through a formal process. Mr Tapsell, could I ask you please to turn to exhibit TCT12 of your rubric uh, 413 statement, that's document ANZ.772.0089. Was that TCT? 12. 12, yes. Uh, Mr Tapsell, you referred in evidence a number of times to the exclusion criteria that apply to informal overdrafts, and you said there was a, a whole list. Uh, is this document the list that you were referring to? There was a what, Miss? Sorry? You said there was a whole list. Is yes. this document at TCT 12 the list you were referring to? Yes, it is. You were asked some specific uh, questions concerning the Centrelink exclusion criteria that you referred to. Uh, can I direct your attention to the uh, fifth last line on the bottom of page 0089. Sorry, 00... 0089, the fifth last line in the table on that page. Oh, sorry, on that page. Sorry. Yes? Uh, is that the Centrelink criterion you were referring to when you mentioned that in your evidence? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr Tapsell. And uh, while we are on this document, can I ask you to turn to page 0090? And uh, could you look under the heading uh, three, limit assignment rules? I'm sorry, we'll just pause oh, for sorry. a moment yes. while the document's brought up on the screen. ANZ 800.772.0090. Thank you. Do you see the heading there, Limit Assignment Rules? Yes. Uh, are you able to identify from those rules uh, whether an informal overdraft can currently attach to an Access Basic account? It cannot attach to an Access Basic account. And uh, for how long has that been the position, Mr Tapsell? Uh, as long as this document, so pre-November, I think it's pre-November 17. Thank you. And are you able to identify uh, from page from the limit assignment rules at page 0090 whether an informal overdraft can presently attach to an ANZ pensioner in advantage account? Yes, it cannot attach to a pensioner advantage account now. Thank you, Mr Tapsell. Uh, now just uh, returning for a moment to uh, Client one referred to in Mr Bowden's uh, statement. Uh, could Mr Tapsell, uh, could we have on the screen please uh, ANZ.800.852.0089? Sorry, 0002. Mr Tapsell, is that an example of the uh, form that you uh, referred to in giving evidence earlier that a customer can fill in uh, in order to uh, restrict or switch off the informal overdraft facility on their account? Yes. Thank you. Uh, 
and could we have on the screen, please, exhibit, uh, I'm sorry, document, I, I would rather I tender that document, Commissioner, before I move on. Request to restrict informal overdraft facility form. ANZ 800 852 0002, Exhibit 4.210. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, could, could the witness be shown, please, uh, document number ANZ 800 853 uh, 0095. Mr Tapsell, are you able to uh, recognise this uh, form of document? This is a form of document you've seen from ANZ's uh, systems at all? Yes. Uh, are you able to identify the, the nature or the name of the system for which a document like this is uh, produced? I know. Thank you. Um, and if we could turn to uh, page 0103 within that document, please. If we could just enlarge that uh, page, if possible. I'd have to be more specific, Ms Williams. It's a very large page. Which part do you want enlarged? I see. Uh, I want, I'm sorry. I wanted to enlarge the uh, material under the heading uh, Diary Comments uh, so as to be able to see uh, the entry dated 8 December 2017 on that page. Thank you. Mr Tapsell, can I direct your attention to the first entry dated 8 December 2017? Yes. Uh, are you able to uh, explain for the Commission the meaning of, of that entry? What action or, or other matter it is referring to? 8th of December 2017? Yes. Request received to remove online dibs limit Received an action, no further action. It's, it's to remove a, um, to remove the informal overdraft limit. Thank you, Mr Tapsell. I, I, I tender that document, Commissioner. Well, to whom does it relate? Uh, what am I to make of it, Ms Williams? I know, yes, uh, I'll mark it, but it, it's simply a form standing in the desert at the moment. Uh, it relates to client one referred to in Mr Bowden's statement, uh, Commissioner, and that is apparent from the information on the first page of the document which has been redacted for confidentiality. Profile page, I know system client number one, ANZ, 85, uh, ANZ 800 853 0095, exhibit 4.211. Thank you, Commissioner. Pardon me one moment, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. I have nothing further for us to do. Yes. Costello, is there anything arising out of that? No, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Now, Ms Orr, where do we go from here? I'm going to deliver our open, our, I'm sorry, our closing address, Commissioner, but perhaps we might give the ANZ Council an opportunity to leave the bar table. If I come back at what, 20 to midday or, uh, or 25 to, or what yeah, do you want? Yes, somewhere between those two, five, <laughs> five minutes, but no more would be very helpful. Thank you, Commissioner. Right, we have I'll a bit to get through. Sure. C Commissioner, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. There were some, uh, documents I wish to tender, as I indicated yesterday, that relate to client two in Mr Bowden's case. Would that be a convenient moment to do that at this stage? Yes, have you a list of them? Thank you. Um, uh, uh, the have you a list of them? Uh, I do have, I don't now need to tender everything on the list, but I, I do have a list that can be handed up uh, together with the, the documents, if that's more convenient to do them 
well, in a bundle. Let's follow whatever's the most efficient means of doing this, Ms Williams. Let's get on with it. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, uh, if I could uh, tender document uh, ANZ 800.852.0001 uh, being a request to restrict informal overdraft facility form. Dated 29 November 2017. Concerning client two? Yes, Commissioner. Exhibit 4.212. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and uh, I tender uh, a call recording uh, dated uh, 30 November 2017. Document number, also relating to client two, document number ANZ 800 851 0002. Exhibit 4.213. Thank you, Commissioner. I tender a, a transcript prepared by my instructing solicitors of that call in order to assist the Commission. Transcript of call recording ANZ. ANZ 800.857.0001. Exhibit 4.214. I tender a call recording relating to client two dated 1 December 2017. ANZ 800.851.0003. Exhibit 4.215. I tender a transcript prepared by my instructing solicitors of that call to assist the Commission. Transcript of call recording, ANZ. 800.857.0004. Exhibit 4.216. And finally, Commissioner, I tender an INO record relating to client two, uh, ANZ.800.856.0001. Exhibit 4.217. Thank you, Commissioner. Come back at 20 to midday.